Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of True Picks. We said last week that we weren't sure if it was going to be an every week kind of thing, but we're trying to make sure that we uh, we take care of that for you, that we, that we put in the work and get get this content out here for you, this pick show for the NFL for this season here every single week. Last week we picked uh, week three, and uh, both of us, uh, interestingly, went five and eleven because for the for the the ones that we we picked differently, that that's where it, that's actually where it came down. Uh, let's let me do a little a little recap here of of what we uh, what we missed and what we got right. So Chase took the Browns, I took the Giants. The Giants ended up winning. Then uh, Chase took the Ravens, I took the Cowboys. And the Cowboys completely stunk up the joint. Dak was just padding his numbers. And then uh, Chase took the Falcons. And I took the Chiefs. That's really the – those are really the places that we differed. Uh, there was a couple of uh, – as you can see now, granted, these were the Wednesday night uh, odds from, from, uh, from FanDuel. But a lot of the underdogs really picked out uh, their wins. You know, like, I mean, I don't think anybody – Granted, despite how well, actually, no. Let's let's do it that way. Chase, what were your uh, two or three biggest surprises from this past week? Oh man! Uh, first off, I'll have to say the Denver Broncos. They came out there, and uh, the offense uh. <laughs> offense was uh, clicking against the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and they stifled what was a really good Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense. Uh, another surprise for me was the Cardinals. How flat they came out against Detroit. I felt yes. for sure with all the momentum that they had and everything that they would come out and they would just be ready to strike on a Detroit Lions team that was kind of teetering. But the Lions got another ugly win under their belt. So uh, that was good for the Lions. They really needed that win. And honestly, the Rams <laughs> upsetting the 49ers and in, in, in a comeback upset. It wasn't just like some regular upset. It, it was yeah. a huge comeback by the, the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, shows that coaching is important in the NFL. And, you know, even though if injuries happen, if you have a good football coach, you're able to overcome that. So those were like my two or three bigger surprises, to be honest, just those those three teams, uh, to be honest. Yeah, uh, I the surprise to me was the Browns and the Giants, mainly because even especially after that, that first like play, basically, where uh, the Giants turn the ball over, Browns get that quick touchdown, Amari Cooper gets the pass from Watson. I was thinking to myself, "Oh man, this is going to be uh this is going to be a hell of an interesting situation for Daniel Jones to try to dig himself out of because it's it's tough when you're not that great of a quarterback. I mean, he probably feels confident about himself whatever, but numbers are numbers and lo and behold, again, if you have a wide receiver the caliber of a Malik Neighbors, magic can happen because yeah. if if last week if if uh well now two weeks ago andy siebert misses one of those seven field goals giants beat the 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 commanders if uh this week things go slightly differently the the giants actually win much more decisively so when you have a wide receiver like malik neighbors it can really turn a franchise around uh, you know, it, it, it's, it reminds me of the, it reminds me of the Bengals not too long ago because in, in certain respects, because Burrow yeah. way better of a quarterback than Daniel Jones. But the question in that draft was, do you take Jamar Chase or do you take Penny Sewell? Do you take the guy who's going to be able to protect Burrow and then keep him upright? Cause he had just gotten injured and all that kind of stuff. The giants in a very similar situation. They're saying to themselves, we have the sixth overall pick. Do we take Malik Neighbors or do we take the ability to protect Daniel Jones? And they said, okay, we trust the moves we made in the offseason to kind of rebuild this offensive line. And so we're going to we're going to take Malik Neighbors. And the line has looked shoddy, but they've kept him upright long enough <laughs> to be able yeah. to. Malik neighbors. So if the Giants, I'm not, you know, granted, we're, this is only week four. But if the Giants do well enough that they feel comfortable with Daniel Jones, which, you know, that's to be determined, they can afford to use that first-round pick 
on an offensive lineman. They could potentially trade it as part of a package to get an offensive lineman. Uh, they'll see who else is out there in free agency. Um, we were talking yesterday on, on True Hill Heat Sports Entertainment when we were doing the Monday watch along with – uh, the with Utah, I was asking about cornerbacks, and we were talking about the cornerback free agency. There's also going to be some good tackles that are yeah. out, some good linemen that are available, uh, whether uh, tackle, guard, center, to potentially keep building upon this uh, restructured offensive line. The other surprise for me uh, was the commanders and the Bengals because yeah, that I, I could pick the Broncos. But the Commanders and the Bengals, that one just stood out to me so much more because this was a team that should have lost that game on paper. And it really is a testament to the coaching of Dan Quinn, the coaching and scheme of Cliff Kingsbury to be able to work with what he has and the dedication of that offensive line to protect Jaden Daniels as much as they possibly, possibly could. And this kid looked amazing. He looked electric. If yeah. there was a, you know, and I don't know if the Bears are going to solve whatever the hell is going on with the Bears. I'm sure we're going to, we will be talking about that. But if there was, if Caleb was the favorite for rookie of the year, it's got to be Jaden Daniels now. I, I can't see a situation where I was looking at FanDuel earlier today and uh, Jaden's now, I think, plus uh, 135 or 145 and his is the favorite for Rookie of the Year. Caleb's dropped down to plus 550. The next two highest are Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr. And Marvin Harrison looked good for week three. But it wasn't comparative to week two. And granted, that was maybe an outlier because that's just yeah. bonkers. But the fact that Mal that Marvin Harrison is above Caleb Williams now is pretty, pretty astounding. And it is kind of a testament to how the Bears have come out of the gate. So uh, those are my two big surprises for the week, uh, particularly because the Bengals falling to 0-3. Wow. But we'll be, we'll be talking <laughs> about their ability to get out of that uh, coming up right now. But before we do that, I just want to remind everyone who is watching, thank you all for watching. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button if you have not already. There's so much amazing content here on the True Elite Sports and Entertainment channel because it's not just sports. It's not just entertainment. It's both. And sometimes when there's sports, we try to provide the entertainment uh, during the conversations. Uh, and I'm sure there's sports analogies when they're covering the TV shows and all the thing and the movies and doing the reviews that way. So let's get into this week four slate of games. It is the, the last week before bye weeks happen. So we are again getting a double header on Monday night football. But before oh, we, that, before we get to Monday night football, before we even get to Sunday night football, we have to get through Thursday night football, which is the, uh, the reeling, the reeling Dallas Cowboys versus, I don't know if I would say quietly confident, but at least optimistic New York Giants. They're hosting the Cowboys. This one, it a few. It's crazy that a few weeks ago this would feel like a no-brainer, and now it's a situation where I it, it, it's almost a toss-up to me because Dak and the offense cannot get on the same page. You yeah. cannot get on the same page with those receivers, even to the point that CD Lamb is suffering. And a lot of people took CD Lamb high in in redraft. I know I have him in dynasty, and I have him in a redraft. And you know, I'm the kind of guy that loves to stack quarterback wide receiver combos. So you better believe I also have Dak Prescott. And uh, I mean, I, I won last week <laughs> by 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 the grace of God, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it was not looking pretty there for a while. I, I don't think that the Cowboys can afford to drop this game, and I don't think they will simply because this is a, a great rivalry game yeah. from, from the history aspect. Both of these teams are going to play hard. Malik Neighbors is going to get his first taste of the Giants-Cowboys rivalry, but I think Mike McCarthy knows that if he can't pick up this Giants win, uh, win considering the slate of games that they're going to be facing down the road, it's going to get even tougher. And I think he could, he's thinking about shit. I could get fired by the end of November 
or even like middle of November if I can't turn this around really quickly. So I'm going to take the Cowboys on this one. What about you? Yeah, I'm going to go with the Cowboys as well. I think the Giants, they're going to definitely give them a good fight. Uh, this is going to be one of those ugly Thursday night games. I don't think we're going to have the fun Malik Neighbors game this one. Uh, but this is going to be a very, very ugly game. Here, two things are going to happen. Dak is either going to make a funny turnover that makes NFL memes happy, or Daniel Jones is going to do the same exact thing. What, it's all based on the quarterback and which version of Dak Prescott shows up. We're going to get that top five MVP Dak Prescott from last year, or are we going to get this version of Dak Prescott? One thing that the Giants have the advantage over the Cowboys is the Cowboys, they can't run that football. That, that football ground game is horrible. Like They cannot run the ball. Singletary has looked good for the Giants. Giants yeah. defense has stepped up when they need to step up. So the Cowboys, they can't go into this game thinking, oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna dog walk the New York Giants. Like, no, the Giants, they said they're they're not as bad as we thought. They're a little bit more competent. Uh, but I, I do think it, it relies on the quarterback and who takes care of the football better here. And I, I'm putting my money on Dak on this one. I think Dak will take care of the football much better than <laughs> Danny Dimes. Uh, I, I just Al Michaels is just hoping for a good game. He's just saying. Please let this be a good game. I, I'm tired of these blowouts on Thursday night. Uh, Amazon, thanks for paying me all this money, but right? I, I want at least a good game. I want a good game to watch on Thursday. So I'm going to be the Cowboys too because I just think Dak will make the less mistakes against the New York Giants. And speaking of a guy who is not making mistakes, at least for his first week, Andy Dalton. Took the Panthers and in two and a, in under two and a half quarters had the same amount and more yards, two hundred forty six, than uh, Bryce Young had in two full games. So eight quarters, Bryce had two hundred forty five zero touchdowns. Andy Dalton had two hundred forty six and three touchdowns, and he wasn't done passing that day, so he exceeded, which uh, is pretty damning for uh, Bryce's favorite. Uh, uh, for sorry for Chase's favorite uh, roll tide quarterback, Bryce Young. Yeah. But now, now the Panthers after that, I gotta say, inspiring win. Deontay Johnson looking phenomenal. Uh, get to host the Bengals, who are absolutely another team that are re are reeling. This is a a weird season so far. The the the, the favorites have. Have to, to at least get out to decent starts have not been doing so. And granted, the Bengals, particularly Joe Burrow, have not always looked that great in September, and they put it together by the end of the year. But, you know, it you can't even really say that because of how well Joe Burrow played on Monday night. It was, yeah. three, if I remember right, it's 324 yards, three touchdowns, a really high uh, a QBR. He was not really making mistakes. It was just a question of could you go punch for punch with the commander's offense, and the commander's offense just edged them out. There is something to be said, and I can understand this. You know, last week we were talking about uh, run first quarterbacks and their and their abilities and and what they can bring to the game, and just the way that they can help a running offense. Many men, Brian Robinson looks great, which. Yeah. Granted, last year he was shot and all that kind of stuff. Uh, coming back, it took him a little while to get going. But they also didn't have the quarterback play to defend the idea that we could run the ball. And so if it was just tougher for him to get that sledding because teams were not afraid of the throw. They were not, they were not afraid of the pass. Now with Jaden, you don't know if he's going to run. You don't know if he's going to pass. And he's making completions huge downfield completions in addition to hitting the the intermediate and short routes that it's opening up those lanes for for Robinson but that's the that's that's the commanders the Bengals I mean they looked great Zach Moss yeah. looked great Chase Brown probably should be getting more snaps T Higgins came back did not show that much sign of rust for being uh you know a, a holdout for for a little while and I think he had picked up a little bit of an injury but didn't look didn't look uh, bad at all. The Bengals have to win this game, and oh, it's yeah. it's it's weird that we're we're saying this back to back. But the Bengals, if they want to be viable in the division, when you have the Steelers, the Justin Fields led Steelers being three, three and zero, you gotta win this game. You can't be zero and four. Forget 
the idea of winning the division, making the playoffs as a wild card is going to be insane. And so I, I'm taking the Bengals on this one, but man, I'm sure the Bengals really wish they were still playing against Bryce Young. How do you feel yeah. about this one? Yeah, I think uh, the defense really let them down in this game against the Commanders. And the Panthers obviously took on a tough Raiders defense, made that Raiders defense look really human and made me say, wow, I was calling this defense great. Like Andy Dalton's dicing you up. Maybe, maybe Andy Dalton was just playing with no fear. Andy Dalton has like, the fun, he, he could do the funniest thing. Not only did he beat the Raiders, who, by the way, uh, have a coach. I don't know. He coached him for a while named Marvin Lewis on their staff. But he could he could ultimately beat the team that drafted him and kind of left him in this quarterback purgatory that he's been in ever since. Uh, but I don't think that's going to happen. You know, I think that was the Panthers. Good momentum. You know, it was just like, oh, this is fun. Losing Adam Thielen hurts because yeah. Thielen is kind of important to their offense. And so no feeling like if, if Thielen was playing, honestly, I would give the Panthers a better shot. I would say, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised because that Bengals defense ha hasn't looked good. And, and the problem with the Bengals is they play down to the level of the competition. I could see them playing down to the level of the Carolina Panthers, but I do got the Bengals winning. I don't see how they're going to drop 0-4. That would be absolutely insane. This is a team that a lot of people are saying could be a Super Bowl uh a Super Bowl team, and yeah. they're not looking at it like it at all. Joe Burrows looked good last uh, last night on Monday Night Football, but other than that, nothing really you can pinpoint to this Bengals team and saying, "Oh yeah, they're a good team." They're probably just middle of the road at best. So, yeah, but I got them winning this game. If they lose this game, oh Zach Taylor, that, those conversations have to happen. Yeah. They have to happen soon because you, you know it's funny. There's a thing. So Zach Taylor, zero and three. His brother, who's an offensive coordinator is 0-3 for his team that he's coaching. And then Bryce Callahan, former offensive coordinator under Zach Taylor, 0-3 with the Titans. Oof. Wait, who? Uh, who's his brother? Uh, Finn Taylor or something? Phil, it's like it's a, a, what team is he on? I'm trying to remember. He's on a 0-3 team. That's all I know. <laughs> and, the, the worst, and the offenses are like not doing so well. I, I shared it. Uh, Jags offensive coordinator. Oh shit! Jeez. Jeez. <laughs> not not good for the not for the Taylor co Taylor he coaching tree. That's a guy who should not have been let on the. We'll we'll, we'll get to that one. Uh, but yeah, that that'll be this will be one of the fun ones to watch. Um, again, you know, la last week I was saying, man, I was waiting, looking forward to watching uh, Cardinals and Lions. And that game <laughs> disappeared. <laughs> we'll we'll see. I, I'm only interested in this one. Uh, because I want to see the Bengals get right, and I just want to see if Andy – like, Andy Dalton's playing with so much house money, and he's basically playing like he doesn't give a shit. And when yeah. you, sometimes when you're playing that free and that loose, things just open up. So we will see if that uh, Adam Thielen, the loss uh, of Adam Thielen, uh, really does affect the Panthers, if it affects Deontay Johnson's ability to get open. Uh, you know, I originally had picked up in, in Dynasty because I – in one league because I'm suffering on uh, tight ends. I was able to get Tommy Tremble, and I was like, I mean, let's see if – because Bryce Young, safety blanket, hasn't really used him that much, but maybe there's going to be a difference. And Andy Dalton was like, yeah, we do have a tight end. He's right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not, not bad option. Yeah, and this is a very big game for Legette and Mingo, two guys that yeah. like – especially yeah. Ming, especially Mingo. Legette, I think he'll be fine in the league, but Mingo – very high second round pick. Got compared to a Debo Samuel, a, a do it all type of wide receiver. Just hasn't really panned out. So this is a big game for those two young players to step up as well uh, with a, with a veteran quarterback like Andy Dalton. So that'll be very interesting to see. But yes, moving from uh, one team that was kind of considered to be a Super Bowl favorite to come out of the AFC in the Bengals, we turn to another in the New York Jets who didn't look – they looked a little rusty, you know, coming week one, week two. But, hey, getting to play the Jacoby Brissett-led New England Patriots is a get-right game for, for for teams nowadays. And uh, even, even with that New England defense, but especially when you have a quarterback that can carve up a defense, and especially when you have the rivalry – that's existed for years between the Jets and the Patriots. But now the Jets, after picking up that win, get to host the Denver 
Broncos. And uh, this one is, again, just like last week, I think it's almost exactly the same. Uh, it might be the pretty pretty close to the same line as last week, 270, 335. Um, but right now, Jets are favored by three uh, negative 370 on money line on FanDuel. Whew. This this is this is uh, I'm picking the Broncos because uh, I, I think I have to at this point. Uh, mm-hmm. This is uh, this is just too much. This is too much fun uh, after watching that Broncos offense. Now, granted, I completely understand that the Tampa Bay offensive line was missing its left tackle, and I understand that Vita Vea was not there for the defense, nor was one of their safeties. That being said. Bo Nix got his best game by far uh, against the 2-0 at the time Tampa Bay Bucks. Pat Sertain was able to shut down Mike Evans. There was a, uh, a conversation on the Dynasty Fantasy Football subreddit uh, before the game. At somebody asking, should I bench Mike Evans? Uh, for And I mean, they, they, they had two, uh, two options. One was, uh, I think, Zach Charbonnet. And uh, the other one was, I want to say, I want to say actually Deontay Johnson and people said, start your studs. And normally that's great advice, but yeah. as you know, the PS2 effect is real. Yeah. He and shuts down people. He shuts down people. And there was a question whether, because in week one, Pat just guarded one side of the field and in week two, he, he shadowed uh, Pickens. The question was whether or not he was going to do that. And he did shadow Evans throughout majority of the game, but he also did play a side of the field. And I think that was smart to just continually switch it up. And from what I saw, most of Evans' catches, because he I think he had three targets, two catches, most of them both of I think both of them came, maybe one of them came when it was not certain guarding him. Mm -hmm. So you know we'll see what happens. Uh just just if if you had a number of different things to watch. Or, or reasons to watch a game. Garrett Wilson against Pat Sertain alone would be a reason to watch this game. Yeah. And then you add on Cortland Sutton, who is seeing a resurgence with the level of confidence that Bo Nix is playing with. Bo was just standing there in the pocket, was willing to take hits. We would, we would see week one and week two. He would backpedal a little bit when the pressure was on. Now he's standing up in the pocket. He's moving up in the pocket. They actually did uh, at least one designed run, which I thought was a good, uh, smart move. Just remind people this guy does have wheels. Uh, Seeing Cortland Sutton going up against a Sauce Gardner, that's also going to be really interesting to watch. I am also, though, terrified of this Jets D-line. Yeah, it's a good one. The Denver offensive line, particularly because – the Broncos have had so much trouble running the ball. And a lot of people thought that Javante Williams coming off of the ACL tear from two years ago, last year he was there, but he really wasn't. A lot of people said, Hey, you know, we've seen miracles of modern medicine. And so people sometimes think that an ACL tear, you can bounce back one year, but usually it it really does take two years to get that explosiveness back. This is the second year. A lot of people thought he would, be back to what he was. He doesn't really look like that. And Jaleel McLaughlin, as much as he is an electric runner in space, between the tackles, he's not as good because he's a bit of a smaller back. They've had Tyler Beatty. Uh, Beatty reverted uh, to the practice squad. I think they're probably going to bring him back up for for this game uh, if he doesn't get signed by somebody. Hopefully he doesn't. Um, But this one's going to be interesting. And on the flip side, the Jets – Rodgers has looked good, granted, yeah. New England, New England uh, defense, which the New England offense did not help the New England defense out whatsoever. Uh, but he's looked good. Brees Hall has looked amazing. And out of nowhere, the Jets have a good one-two punch at running because Braylon yeah. Allen, this rookie, has looked phenomenal, especially uh, against – I think it was week week two, uh, week two looked amazing. So this one is – I don't know if the line really reflects it. To me, it's much more of a toss-up simply because the question marks, if they if they go one way or they go another. It's not, it's not as simple as 
the Broncos are terrible and the Jets should be cruising to a win. There is enough that the Broncos have shown from that Tampa Bay Bucks game that, hey, they could be feisty in this one. But what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think the Jets, I'm going to lean towards them in this one. I think Aaron Rodgers is a much better quarterback than Baker Mayfield. Uh, one of the things that the Broncos have to the advantage is that they're probably going to be familiar with the offense. It is Nathaniel Hackett offense, yes. so they are probably going to be really familiar with that, and I'm always a fan of familiarity. But I think the Jets are going to do the same strategy that they did with Jacoby, Jacoby Brissett. They're going to try to force – the quarterback to throw deep because the Jets were blitzing very heavy against Jacoby Brissett, making sure the run game was not a thing that they could rely on, and then forcing the quarterback, hey, can you throw it deep? And that was the only time the Patriots were able to move the ball was when Brissett was able to hit those seam routes down the middle. They're going to try to do the same thing with Bo Nix. They're going to say, hey, either Bo Nix throws it deep or not. And that's their game plan. That's going to be their strategy. And I think that strategy will work out. And I don't think they're too concerned because I think Aaron Rodgers, he's going to come in and he's just going to, he's just going to play lights out football. I think this is going to be the vintage Rodgers three touchdown performance type of game where oh, everyone's like, Oh yeah. yeah, I think, I think it's going to be one. I think it's going to be one of those. I think Rodgers, he, he's, he's going to, he's going to play really well this game. That one, two pat punch of Hall and Allen, uh, really makes it where they can control the football. Like, and, and that's the one thing too about the Jets. I think they will be able to control the football a little bit better than Denver. And you know, Bonix is still a rookie, so he's going to make rookie mistakes. It's not like he's going to be uh, perfect. He's going to he's going to force a ball that's going to lead to an interception. That Jets secondary is still no joke, even though they're missing some pieces. So I got the Jets in this one, but I think it will be the score will be much closer. Like at the at the Jets are. Like six and a half favorites, I, I would put money on the Broncos to cover the spread. I think they'll cover that spread easily. Yeah, I mean, I I would think that you know, Bo is a better quarterback than Jacoby Brissett, and I would think, I mean, I would hope that Court and Josh Reynolds are better than Pop Douglas, Jalen Polk, and Javon Baker. But we'll we're, we're definitely going to see. Uh, this I think is a really good test, a really good test for Sean Payton's strategy. And if we are, if we do continue to see Bo make another step forward in just that ability to process and see pre-snap movements and all that kind of stuff, I think it's going to work out a lot better. One thing that I do think is interesting is that the first two weeks, uh, Sean's play calling was fucking long. There was like 15 words and they cut it down so that uh, it was, it was a, instead of taking like 15 seconds, just to hear it and relay it, it was six seconds. And that gave Bo more time to see pre-snap what was what what he was seeing in front of him. So we'll we'll take a look at that and we'll see how this one pans out. But a battle where we're now starting to similar to the, the Giants Cowboys game, we are starting to see uh the the divisional matchups. Um they started, they did start uh beginning of uh, I think it was week three, but the two Thursday night games also, um, we because one week we saw what was it? Um, not it was Jets and somebody or other, uh, and then there was Dolphins and and then last week it was sorry previously it was Bills Miami and then yeah. it was Jets Patriots. So we yep. did see two divisional matchups on Thursday night football. We're seeing another one this week, but we're starting to see them get sprinkled out into the actual Sunday games, and that we start talking about that with this next one, the Falcons and the Saints. And you and I both said this last week. If Derek Carr plays competent and doesn't make mistakes, the yeah. Saints defense is good enough to make sure that they're going to hang in every game and can outscore pretty easily. And we saw Derek Carr make mistakes. We saw that interception at the end of the game against the Eagles that sealed the win for the Eagles. And it was not a dominant Eagles win at all. Ugly but, win. But you could now make an argument that you shouldn't be able to get a dominant win against the Saints because of how good that offense and that defense has looked. Now they face a test of coming into the Falcons' house in Atlanta to try to take on Kirk Cousins, who – if a DPI call is properly, <laughs> it's properly called, <laughs> he wins that game. Yep. He wins that game yep. against the Chiefs. It's really funny because uh, we were talking during that Bengals-Chiefs game 
about how that was uh, the, the DPI call or was not yeah. a DPI call that went against uh, the Bengals. And we and both of us were just like, yeah, I mean, the defender got there early, but it's not like he was impeding that much to the point no. of this guy couldn't catch it. Here we have a guy not even looking at the ball. He's not playing the ball whatsoever, and he's basically trying to do a really weak version of a spear against Kyle Pitts to, get, to stop him from getting the ball, and they don't call that as a DPI. And it's like, all right. I think everybody understood if you gave Atlanta a fresh set of downs on the goal line, Bijan Robinson is at some point going to, going to get a yard. Now, granted, granted on fourth and inches a little while later, oh, God. they decided to run a sweep, but that's last week. This is this week. And here the Falcons hopefully are learning from their mistakes. But part of the problem to me is the Falcons offense is very one dimensional. It's just we're going to run with B. John Robinson until you realize that we're going to run with B. John Robinson. You come up to defend, and then we throw to London yep. or Darnell Mooney, whichever one's open. That's really the entire offense. Kyle Pitts has disappeared in this offense. Tyler Algier is being used, but really just to spell uh, B. John Robinson. When a couple of years ago, people were asking themselves, yes. We understand. Remember, I and I remember clearly because that was that was uh, a time where I had I took an L during the the draft. I was saying a lot of us were saying there's no way that the, the Falcons would take Bijan Robinson because they have Tyler Algier. And you, sir, were the one that said <laughs> it's a character issue. It's a character question. Bijan Robinson fits the mold of what the Atlanta Falcons want to be. That's why they're taking him. They want to have a good one-two punch, and now they do. But Tyler Algier is a good pass catching back. And they don't really seem to want to use him that way. They yeah. just want to use him as somebody who is going to spell Bijan Robinson. Now, if they already had signed Algier to uh, his second contract, and because they had Bijan, they put in a lot of incentives for yardage or catches, that kind of thing, then I could understand, hey, we're not going to throw to this guy as much so we don't have to pay him. <laughs> yeah, so we don't have to give him the money, yeah. <laughs> but in this situation, he's still on a rookie contract. Why not use this guy when you have a great pass catching back like Algier? It does kind of uh, boggle the mind because Cousins is a good enough quarterback that you could afford if you don't trust – I don't even remember who it is right now uh, – wide receiver three on the – Ray Ray uh, McLeod. Uh, oh, Ray Ray McLeod. You could, af you could afford to go four wide and yeah. have Tyler Algier be one of the wide receivers. Plus, you'd have Pitts. That's five. Bijan, six. Uh, Kirk, seven. Maybe maybe you, maybe you, uh, you, you go uh, empty set – no Bijan, and you have that. And so you have the full uh, five linemen, and you yeah. either you have Pitts do a chip block and then run out, or he's there as the blocker to distract your your linebacker and think is Pitts going to break out, and then your four guys can go. Algiers good enough to be a receiver in that situation. So I don't know really what the hell the Falcons are doing because that was a game they should have won. They. And, and which is crazy considering it is the Chiefs. And and I think the reason why last week you picked the Falcons was because you said every once in a while, it's actually in the beginning of the year, Mahomes has that just terrible last game. Yeah, and he it's did have. Last game. And it looked like that. And I'm watching it, and I was like, shit, you know, Chase, we we, we both watched this, this asshole <laughs> so many times a year. How did I not pick up that this could be the game where he just has a terrible last game and then, you know, things happen? But – for who I'm picking in this one, I'm taking the Saints. I'm hoping that uh, Derek Carr is able to play mistake-free football at least another week. Uh, but this, especially this line, is so close. I'm I'm taking the Saints for this one. What about you? I don't like any of these head coaches. I think Dennis Allen. I think Dennis. I think if you ask the people who's the Saints head coach, they have to think about it for a little bit because you. Dennis Allen just has no charisma, no aura whatsoever. But I just think Raheem Morris is such an idiot. He wasn't even a good head coach in the past. That, that was the one hire that made no sense to me was Raheem Morris. I was just like, I think Morris is a good coordinator. I don't think he's a good head coach. And to me, normally when there's two coaches I don't like, I just go to the one that I think is a little bit better. <laughs> and, and Dennis Allen's just a little bit better than Raheem Morris. I, I don't know what Morris is doing. I really don't. This Falcons team is so inconsistent. 
they're going to be that frustrating nine and 18. They're, they're going to be that team where it's like one week, they look amazing. Then the other week, Kirk looks good. And then for whatever reason, they go back to running. But like you said, how, how many times did they call the wide receiver screen to Darnell Mooney in that freaking game against the Chiefs? It's like, all right, cool. If you have Darnell Mooney in a PPR league, he probably got you a crap load of points just for perceptions. But that, like the Chiefs weren't being fooled by that whatsoever. Like, why do you keep calling this same plays? Like, do you like, and especially Kirk can push the ball down the field. Like, you guys know that you guys can do this. They don't take advantage of what they have with Bijan and Algier as running backs as well because they're, they're more than just guys to hand off to. They're both excellent running routes and pass catching. And then Kyle Pitts is just like, I, is he running bad routes? Is What's wrong? Because I watch, I watch, and I, I'll see it, and I'm like, bro, Pitts looks fine to me. Like, is there something in practice we don't know about that he doesn't get attention? Like, because well, what I – is he he had that one catch and that's uh, for like 50 something yards yeah i think that's gonna like if people just look at the stat line they're gonna be like well yeah Kyle Pitts had a pretty good game but the majority of the routes he was running were short routes they yeah. were either into the flat or they were curl routes or some you know to that nature where he was barely going past uh the the, the first down marker and so mm -hmm. it's like this is supposed to be a generational receiving talent at, at tight end yeah why aren't you using him better yeah they, they need to start using him a lot better and I, I thought with Kirk Cousins this would be the Kyle Pitts unlock season because right. he loved using Hawkinson he loved going to Hawkinson whenever Jettis was double covered or he couldn't find KJ Osborne on a certain route like he would throw to Hawkinson so I thought this would be good I I, I don't know I just think Raheem Morris is an idiot so I'm just gonna go with the other idiot Dennis Allen in this one I'm with the Saints too the oh. fact that they're underdogs that's insane. The Saints being underdogs in this situation, like, was well, just because the Falcons are at home. They're just like, oh yeah, let's let's give it to the let's give it to the Falcons. They're they're way more important. <laughs> like, no Saints. And, that, that. You know, to your to your point, um, this is a it, it's weird because yes, Jetta's by far better wide receiver than Drake London. So you would think that London can't beat the coverage every time. You would then throw to Pitts more. You'd actually want yeah. to throw more than you were throwing to Hawkins. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, like what's what's your reads here? Is 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 it London one, two being your slot, and then three being your running back? Like, no, you're you're doing your reads wrong. It should be one, two, three, Pitts being number two all the time. Like it makes no right. sense. But uh moving from we were just just talking about uh Justin Jefferson. Let's talk about this Vikings Packers game. Wow, you know, the 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 battle of Backup quarterbacks. Well, and, Jordan love my play. They're talking that love oh, might actually it? play this game. Yeah, they, we don't know yet. So as we're filming this, Jordan Love could play, <laughs> and I, yeah, it's going to be interesting this game for sure. And and it's a situation where you would not have thought that either of these backup quarterbacks would be in the position that they're in. Yeah, Malik Willis has looked competent. He is, and 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 in some. In some throws, in some plays, in some quarters, even has looked beyond just competent to actually good. And granted, you know, maybe the the first week the team the, the team they were facing were just like it's just Malik Willis. We don't really have to worry about it. And the Packers were like, okay, well, you know, we'll figure this out. And in the second week, maybe Malik Willis was just motivated because it was up against the Titans. But he's looked good. Now he hasn't had the the the, the numbers that a Jordan Love has had. He has his flaws, but credit where credit is due to Lafleur to being able to cover up those flaws. And hey, when you've got a talent like a Jaden Reed, it's a lot easier to cover up those flaws. When you can run the ball with Josh Jacobs and Emmanuel Wilson, you can cover up those flaws. On the flip side, I don't think anybody. I mean, well, maybe you did because you have been a Sam Darnold truther. But I don't think yeah, anybody yeah. really considered the Vikings to be having the, the season that they're having, where the, the ability to, to take teams to the limit. And granted, any, you know, we say any given Sunday, but anytime you've got Justin Jefferson on a team, you're going to have a, you're going to have a shot. Oh, but, yeah. you know, uh, Jefferson, then you lose Addison. Addison might be back this week. Jalen Naylor has looked really good filling in for a Jordan Addison. 
very similar to how Addison looked really good filling in for Jettas last year. And they're getting good play from uh, Johnny Munz, the tight end that's filling in for Hawkinson before Hawkinson gets back, which they're targeting, I think it was a week seven potential return for Hawkinson. And if Hawkinson gets back and is looking good, Maybe you know it takes a week or two to, to for him to get fully back into gameplay mode. You got to take those hits. Wake you know just wake up the wake up the body, the muscle memory. Darnold's going to be dealing, yeah. but before that, they got to get through this divisional rivalry game. This one is this one's fun. This I I, I it, which is crazy to me to say with a Malik Willis team. Uh, I'm going to once again. <laughs> take the underdogs uh, because I just have a hard time betting against Justin Jefferson at this point. Like it's just, it's just so tough. They battled with the Niners and the Niners took some injuries, but they battled against the Niners to get that win. And the Niners are considered a Super Bowl favorite. Yeah. So I, I can't bet against the Vikings at this point. What about you? Yeah. This game is going to be very interesting, not just offensively, but defensively too. The Packers only had seven interceptions last year. They now have six interceptions this year. Uh, the Vikings, on the other hand, Brian Flores has unlocked this defense. Yeah. Like before he was like the highest blitzing rate defensive coordinator last year, this year, he's not even blitzing that much. And all these sim pressures that he's sending at people or just like doing it's messing with quarterbacks, like quarterbacks stink that a guy's coming, they think a blitz is coming, and then all of a sudden the linebacker drops back or the corner ends up just being on a flat and then <laughs> picks picks the player off. Like Both these defenses are playing out of their minds. I don't know. If Jordan Love is healthy, I don't think you bring him back for this game. I, I like Honestly, like I, it's early in the season. You guys won two games without the guy. Yeah. I, think, I think you guys are still in position for a wild card spot, and I wouldn't risk – you know, Jordan love to come back, feel like he's good, maybe not at 100%, going against this Vikings defense that's been getting home to the quarterback, that has been forcing turnovers. I, I wouldn't put him in that game because that could also crush his confidence as well as a starter at going against a team like this. I, I think the Vikings win this game too. I think Sam Darnold, one thing about Darnold is, like, he's making a lot of gutsy throws. Like, this, this guy, I love what, how Darnold's playing. Like, he is saying, you know what, live or die by the sword. I am throwing this ball double covered. I am doing – like, he, the, the throws that he makes are so sick. Like, these are, like, uh, second-year Mahomes-type throws that Darnold is making where he's just, like – where it's just, like, you shouldn't be throwing that. Oh, he caught it. Wow, that's crazy. That that that, that worked? Oh, okay. Like, that that's why, to me, I, I, I just feel the Vikings, they're playing the most free. And, honestly, this is the battle for coach of the year for me. If KOC wins this and he starts with this team 4-0 – <laughs> there, there's no there's no i'm not you can argue with the wall i could care less they could lose the next 12 uh next 13 games after this koc is the heck coach of the year this, this Viking, this is another case where the quarterback's playing with house money yeah nobody expected anything from darnold and he's just like yeah fuck it let's just i'm gonna throw the ball let's see what happens and aaron jones is like i can bail you out of some of these situations on the ground so it's like let's let's see what happens that, that's another thing i think this is also the aaron jones revenge game like you <laughs> you guys you guys said that i'm washed like you guys got josh jacobs this is your new car oh no buddy I, i'm gonna remind you guys who the fuck i am like <laughs> if you're an aaron jones fantasy owner start him i guarantee you this is the vintage aaron jones three touchdown game like i i just see the vikings just having their way with the Packers. I think the Packers are favorite because they are at home, very similar in terms of defense between both these two teams and the possibility of Jordan Love playing, but I just want to play Jordan Love here. I would honestly so, just say just say keep him healthy. Ride with Malik Willis. Who cares? Like you already won two games. Like I wanted to I, I, two wanted, I wanted to pull up Green Bay's schedule because of what you're saying about not playing uh Jordan Love. After this, after the Vikings the Packers are at Rams, home to Arizona, home to Texans, and then at Jaguars week eight. So if you're not going to put Jordan Love in this week, when like when would you want to put him in? Because those are going to be some good de – those either good defense or good overall teams that he's going to be facing. Uh, uh, do you, come on. The 49ers defense is not good anymore. Brandon Staley's their defense. Oh, Rams, Rams. 
Oh, no, no. I'm saying the 49ers. Just put him in the 49ers. Who cares? That defense does not scare anyone anymore. <laughs> like, no, no, they play, de- they, no, they play the Rams. Yeah. Cardinals. Texans. Oh, they don't play the 49ers? Uh, not till you... week 12. Not till week 12. Oh, okay. Um, I would put them against the Rams. The Rams are still banged Rams. up. Yeah. You know, just, like, just get them healthy. Like, make them – it's a long season. It's not like this That's is true. like – this That's is not true. like – if this was week 17, yeah, you ha- he oh, has to play. Oh, but but this is week four. Like this is week four, and you're two and one. Like this is not like a must win game right off the rip. Because like I said, this game right here, you could put him in, and then what if he tears up his MCL a little bit more? What if he takes a hit that you shouldn't be taking? What if he starts throwing interceptions because he's a little bit rusty? Like just play with Malik Willis. The team the team is is riding behind him right now. Just ride does the hot. The, just ride this hot hand. Does the fact that this is divisional though, and the Vikings are three and zero factor in? It does factor in a little bit, but at the at the end of the day, I, I think they look at this and they like. I think the Packers are going to be contending with the Vikings and the Lions all season long. Like I, I don't think the Packers are going to fall off just because they lose this game to the Minnesota Vikings. If you're the Detroit Lions, you want them to win uh, the Packers because it helps you go out a little bit more. Sure. But but I, I I wouldn't risk my quarterback that I just paid two hundred plus million to. <laughs> to je- to go out there, get his ass kicked, and then oh he he like I get, I, I love players that can play, but in week four of the NFL season, I get it's a divisional game, it's a very important game, but I wouldn't force my quarterback out there right now. I just wouldn't. I would just I would rather have my quarterback come back when he's a hundred percent healthy. Like if Jordan Love says I can play, and if the team doctor says yeah he's about seventy percent, I don't want a seventy percent Jordan Love out there. I want a hundred percent Jordan Love. Like and that's the thing. Like all those games you just mentioned, he's gonna come back a hundred percent. Like that's that's where I would rather have him instead of forcing him in this situation. And you have games that are pretty winnable coming up, anyways. And Malik Willis has shocked people. Just ride the hot hand until your QB one is healthy. They got above expectations. People thought they'd be zero and three with with Malik Willis at the helm, and they're two and one. <laughs> and they're only losses to the freaking Eagles, who are a lot of people's Super Bowl pick. But turning from this rivalry game in the NFC North. Let's turn to the team that just lost mm. to this 3-0 and Vikings squad, and that is the Houston Texans. You know, it, it, it's crazy to say that the Jaguars are looking for their first win in week <laughs> four. Uh, this was definitely not all elite performance against the Bills. Uh, you know, you said earlier, you pointed out earlier that um, Zach Robinson's brother is the OC for the Jaguars. I don't think he should be the OC after <laughs> after last week. Uh, well, yesterday, uh, he should not have been allowed on the plane because if this is the if if people consider the Jaguars to be in the mix for the division, or at least in the mix for the wild card. If you make it to the playoffs, you're going to be playing the Bills. There's very low chance of the Bills missing the playoffs. They're at least getting in. Now, whether whether you know we have a a classic Josh Allen performance in the playoffs where he stinks up the joint and throws two picks and fumbles while he's all that kind of shit, that remains to be seen. But I mean, Romeo says it would happen, but it remains to be seen. The question is, you are going to be playing against them, and, and it could very well be in. Highmark Stadium. So the fact that they went in there and lost that game, but not just lost it, but lost it in the manner in which they did. Beat down. I, I, they, this is one of those must wins for the Jaguars. And for the Texans, yes, you know, we really saw what happens when Joe Mixon isn't on the field for the Texans. And granted, last year, Stroud didn't have Joe Mixon, and he put up video game numbers in certain situations. But there's always something to be said for having a great running back that you can rely on. And at least last year, he had Damian Pierce. And Damian Pierce isn't like this great, world-breaking, earth-shattering running back or anything like that. But at least he is somebody that Stroud knows. He didn't have Damian Pierce either because Pierce has been on the shelf since the start of the season. So he had Cam Akers as his running back. 
And that was not a recipe for success. Now, at the time we're filming this, I'm not sure whether or not Joe Mixon is going to be back. But I'm thinking that the Texans are praying and hoping that he is. If Joe Mixon is back, I think the Texans win this handily. If Joe Mixon is not back, I think that the Texans still win. It's just a little bit tougher. Yeah. The Jags look so demoralized. Oh, that yeah. offense is just I don't I don't know what's going on there because you have Travis Etienne, you have Tanks Tank Bigsby. That's a pretty solid running back room. You have Christian Kirk, Brian Tom, uh, uh BTJ's looked pretty good for for a rookie. Granted, you didn't have Evan Ingram, but Brenton Strange has looked pretty decent. Yeah, he's a good as, as a fill in tight end. So why this offense was struggling so much to move the ball? I don't think that like the Bills' defense is good, but it's, it's not like, world beating. Yeah, it's not, not a world beating defense. It's not fucking. What was the score? It was. It's. It's not forty seven to ten good. So I don't know, man. This I think this is the potentially the start of the 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 downfall of Doug P. in in Jacksonville, but at the same time. Doug P has a Super Bowl ring. I'm I I can't really count him out, but I don't think this is the week where it uh, it turns around for the Jaguars. I'm taking the Texans. How about you? Yeah, that was an embarrassing loss. And normally, when we see embarrassing losses, a team that just got embarrassed, they like to make fools of us who make the picks. They come out, they look great. <laughs> uh, the Texans also had an embarrassing loss, so maybe those things counteract with each other. But I just think the Texans are just a better football team than the Jaguars. Like. You, you talk about the offense. Let's talk about that Jaguars fucking defense. Jeez. All that money that they put into that Jaguars defense, and they let up 47 points. Like, they paid that cornerback that they liked a lot. They paid Josh Allen Hines to be what? their main pass rusher. He's not doing anything. Like, th- this Jaguars defense is just not looking good whatsoever. It feels like if you're a team with a complete offense – you can actually just obliterate this defense. And it doesn't help the Jaguars where you have Doug Peterson, who's a head coach that's very traditional. Like Doug Peterson is one of those guys that no matter how much they're down, he's always going to trust running the football, doing his script. He's going to stick to his game script. He doesn't change his game script. He, he, like that's how Doug Peterson rolls. Like Peterson will take chances every once in a while, but he, he doesn't change his script. So when you go down big early, but you still want to establish the run. We, we, we never know. The game, we could come back. You know, that that's going to hurt. And that's how Trevor Lawrence gets all his deep shots. Lawrence just hasn't looked good. Uh, they posted this on ESPN. 0-8, the worst, the worst record, right, in his last eight starts, worst record in the league right now, 59.9% completion percentage, second worst to Bryce Young. And he has 11 turnovers total, third worst in the league right now. Including, and, and, including as the joke is, throwing it to uh, a guy who's legally dead. Yeah, exactly. So, th- like, Trevor Lawrence is not playing well. I think this is a get-right game for the Texans. It was just more – I think C.J. Stroud just played a defense he wasn't prepared for, and it was just yeah. like they just came in and molly him. And, and, and good quarterbacks have those bad games where, you know, a good defense just shocks their system a little bit. But I think C.J. Stroud, divisional game – Jaguars have not – like, if the Jaguars showed me something besides leading Miami in week number one, I would say, oh, okay. Like, yeah, they're, 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 they they could pull this off. But they haven't shown me anything in these three games that make me say they could pull off an upset here over the Texans. Yeah, like, I mean, and to to anyone who does not know what, uh, what, um, what Chase is referring to when he says the amount of money that was spent on the defense – they re-signed and extended Josh Hines Allen five years, one hundred forty-one million. They re-signed Tyson Campbell, cornerback, four years, seventy-six point five million. They uh, signed Ronald Darby on a two-year deal from the Ravens, uh, eight and a half million. And they signed a three-year contract, Eric Armstead, from the Niners, three years, forty-three point five million dollars. They sp- there's. I mean, there's there's guys here that are, are good to decent who are on one year deals like the Terrell Edmonds, the Trey Flowers, the Darnell Savages. I mean, Savage is a three year deal, but they spent money on this defense. Yeah. And to see, I mean, Josh Allen was just laughing. He was laughing his way. Like this, this was Josh Allen. <laughs> That 
it was Josh Allen and James Cook. It was – there's no other way to say it. Like, he's just la- – like, he's just like anything I want to do. It, it just works. It just works. But man, well, the, the, this is uh, this is a a really key key matchup for that AFC South. But uh, let's turn to another team in the AFC South, as well as a team from the AFC North. And uh, Chase, I I'm sure that for the team from the AFC North, this is how you feel after last week. They're gonna go to fucking federal prison. Federal fucking prison. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that, that defense is pretty uh pretty pretty dirty i think they should go there <laughs> but uh we are of course talking about the steelers uh coming to indianapolis to face anthony richardson and the colts wow you would i mean yes you know a rich only plays five games last year in three of the games he gets hurt and the last game it's hurt for the season but a lot of people had some really high hopes for the for the for the for the Anthony Richardson led Colts. They get uh, not it was Adonai Mitchell, right? Who's the yeah, they, they just, yeah uh, Ad Mitchell, yeah Ad Mitchell. Uh, they draft him to pair him up with Downs and uh, Pittman. Downs is has been out for a couple weeks, but he could potentially make his return here. But this is an offense that on paper should be moving the ball really well and this is kind of a testament to what chase and i have been talking about with run first quarterbacks that have great throws but can't make all the throws or have some kind of issue with accuracy and he's accurate on those deep balls but it seems as though the intermediate stuff (laughs) there's some there's some problem there i'm not 100 what it is but if there's a team you don't want to be facing if you're trying to have uh, trying to work out kinks in the offense, week four, it's the Pittsburgh Steelers <laughs> because that Steelers defense yeah, is absolutely smothering. And Chase and I both know this now from experience. The Chargers played them week three. The Broncos played them week two. This is a really good defense, and and similar to the Saints, as long as Justin Fields plays mistake-free football, they're winning the game. That's yeah. just – that is the script, basically. And Fields, to his credit and to Mike Tomlin's credit, and, you know, what's crazy, Arthur Smith's credit, has at least been able to figure something out with, with Fields where he is not making the mistakes, or if he is making the mistakes, they're able to take care of them and cover them. They know that the defense is going to be able to bail him out. They still don't have the full connection – of quarterback to Pickens, uh, I don't know if uh, if if it's just it just takes some time to work out in this situation, but they got to get there. Fryermuth is being pretty much clockwork, five targets, four catches, thirty to forty yards. It's great for me for my fantasy because I at least know I can count on him to get that many points, <laughs> and I'm like I can. Yeah. That's, what, that's what he's gonna get in a half PPR league. I'll take the catches and the little bit of yardage. It'll work for me. But Najee Harris and Jalen Warren, Jalen Warren did not look that great last week, but Najee looked good enough. And as long as they can keep running the ball, it seems as though it's a it's a win for the Steelers. I'm taking the Steelers on this one. And I got to say, if Justin wins another game, I think – and maybe it's just me being a little bitter, but I think that there's a credible argument to not let Russell Wilson start. Oh, I don't think you should at this point. If he, if even if he doesn't win this game, I think he's he's looked <laughs> way better than. Well, I don't even think there's an argument. Wilson uh, Fields impressed me against the Chargers. I thought he played really well against our defense, which is not a slouch defense. We only let up like two big plays against them. Like it wasn't like our defense let up all these crazy plays. But no, he looked good. He only had one bad mistake. This game though. I think this is my, you know, like the, that 10 o'clock schedule. Like sometimes there's that one game you just see the score. And you're like, whoa, I, I didn't see this one coming. I think it's the Colts and Steelers. I think this is the good Anthony Richardson. We're going to see this game. And and, and everyone's going to be like, what? Really? I'm like, I don't know. There's something about this where the Steelers haven't faced a quarterback like this. 
Like this, this is like a freak of nature quarterback that they're going to be facing. And I think they're going to come in. And sometimes the Steelers do do this. They come in really overconfident against teams with bad quarterbacks. And then those bad quarterbacks tend to smoke them a little bit closer than they like to play it to the vest. I, I honestly think deep shots can get to the Steelers. I saw that in the Chargers game where a lot of the deep shots were open for the Chargers wide receivers. It's just the quarterback didn't have time. Richardson's going to make time for himself. And I think this is a good Anthony Richardson game. I, the Steelers defense will do a good job early, but I, I could definitely see this being that one o'clock Eastern game. You're on red zone and Scott has like, and the, and the Colts Richardson is just doing it again. Oh my God. Have yourself a day. It's 21 zero. This Steelers defense does not know what's going on, but I think this is a good Richardson game. I think that we're uh, Richardson waking up and he's saying, Oh, you know what? I'm going to play good today. Uh, Colts defense looked a lot better, and I think they're going to keep playing a little bit better. And, yeah, I, I honestly think this is also the bad Justin Fields game where Justin Fields mm. looks mortal a little bit, where it's just like, oh, like there's too many takes. Ah, oh, Bears should have kept Fields. Oh, the see Justin Fields, da-da-da. Oh, my God, this and that. And it's like, guys, like sooner or later, Justin Fields will come back down to earth to some degree. I think the Colts game is this some degree. Uh, the Colts secondary looked really good. They had that rookie seventh rounder, that one handed pick. He looked he looked phenomenal. I mean, against hey, the- it, it was a weakened Justin Herbert and Taylor Heineke. Let's yeah, but I, I, I no, I was talking about uh, uh, on the Colts, the the oh, cornerback. The that, yeah, who did they yeah. who did they play last week? They played the Bears. Oh. I mean, it is Caleb Williams. Yeah, it is Caleb. But, work. but yeah, I, I think this is a good Richardson game. I think it's going to be a game where the Steelers' defense – I think Richardson is just going to cause them fits. It's just going to be one of those where they're just like, how do we – like, this – because, like, they struggle with Lamar. You, you think that I'm going to be – like, if Anthony Richardson, like, they're not watching Lamar tape, seeing what Lamar does well against them. And Jonathan Taylor is having a quietly really good resurgence here. Like, yes. he's – that he's doing good. really, really good. Like passing, running, he he's looking like that MVP Taylor again. So that's why I think that they're going to win this game. And I like Steichen. He owns up to his – like when Richardson threw that terrible interception in the red zone, most other coaches would have said, Anthony got to do that better. Steichen, that's on me. I called that play. Taking ownership, not blaming the player. I like that in the head coach. It's always – you know, like when you take ownership as a head coach, that's when I know I like you because, yeah, it is on you. You're the one who called the play. Sorry that the player ran the play differently. That, <laughs> that, like, that, like, I'm sorry. But you thought that was the play. Like, here's the thing. When a coach calls a play, they think that play is going gonna, is gonna to score them a touchdown. Right. Ended up being a turnover. Yeah, Richardson threw the ball. Yeah, it was a bad decision by Richardson. But Richardson was taught that this play was going to score us a touchdown. So he thought that play would score him a touchdown. I. I, I I like Steichen in this situation. I think Steichen, he he is a well aware head coach, a well aware guy. I, even if he fails with the Colts, I think he'll find a job elsewhere later down the r- line. I, I don't think the Colts is the best organization for a guy like Steichen. Sorry, they haven't shown anything besides Peyton Manning in the last in their history. So it is what well, it is. I mean, Andrew they try Luck to they try the to time. kill they try to kill Andrew Luck. They killed Andrew Luck That's, during the, the whole time he was there. True. Like. There's a reason why he retired on him. <laughs> I mean, Josh McDaniels, who's an inept head coach, took a coaching job from them and said, yeah, I don't know. I don't like these guys that backed out. So, you know, McDaniels showing red flags on something. There, there's something to be said there. Uh, ownership also has to play with it. But, yeah, I, I think this will be this, one of the surprise games on your Sunday TVs. That will shock you. But I, I just think the Colts, they could. And also history, I think the Colts play really good against the Steelers, oddly enough. So. But let's turn to the team that the Colts ended up edging out. Now, now that you reminded me uh, uh, of uh, last week, the Chicago Bears. Oh, man. And, you know, a lot of people talked about how Caleb Williams threw for 363 yards, two touchdowns. He finally got his, his first passing touchdowns. That's what annoyed me uh, was because I was really hoping. I was like, every time the, the Broncos got to the red zone – and they ended up kicking a field goal. I was like, could you just not have just got one touchdown just because, so I could be like, Bo Nix happens to be the first quarterback to throw a passing touchdown. And then, of course, Caleb does it, and then Jaden does it. Uh, so Bo's the the odd man out. So maybe I shouldn't have been wishing for that. But um, 
a lot of people were talking about that, and they still look off. They really still look off. They can't run the ball well with uh, with DeAndre Swift, Roshan Johnson, and Khalil Herbert. And this is it's a weird situation because they got to the goal line. Or they got like close within five yards multiple times. And either they were handing the ball off to Roshan Johnson or they were handing the ball off to Khalil Herbert. And what annoyed me about it was that you're basically telling DeAndre Swift, hey, buddy, you're good enough to get us yardage on the rest of the entire football field. But when it comes time to score, we don't trust you. And maybe yeah. he's not the best goal line back. But if he's your primary running back, then all you're doing is undermining the confidence that he has in himself, where he, that he's looking at it going, the team doesn't trust me to score when it counts. They don't trust me to get the yardage when it absolutely counts. And that, to me, is just poor coaching. It's poor decision-making. And, you know, Eberflus has been derided, Evil. rightly so, for years now. But this, you know, you would think you've got this new guy in here. You've got this generational talent. You've got De uh, DJ Moore. You've got Cole Komet. You've got uh, Roma. Do you draft Roma Dunze? Sure, Keenan Allen isn't there. But you have the ability to be creative. Every single – and the other thing was those runs – were basically right up the gut runs. I think there was one where it was like an outside toss, uh, which was I think was a third down one where they were like, oh, up the gut didn't work the first two times. Let's at least try something different. But if you're going to run, you have the ability to do different things. It's If Caleb is as uh, dynamic as, he, as everyone believes him to be, that seems like actually a weirdly great place to do a draw play. Because mm -hmm. he's going to hold on to the ball a little bit longer. They think it's 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 a reverse play action in essence. Like, yeah. it where, where was the, the creativity? It, and it was solely left on Caleb to, from time to time, you know, run let, and throw across his body and get – and then I keep seeing that highlight. And it's like, yeah, he's doing that. But the entire offense just looks off. And I don't know if this is a question of Keenan – just missing Keenan Allen. Again, you know, we go back to hard knocks. Yeah. We go back to hard knocks, and we go, why were they not showing us the chemistry between Caleb and Keenan? Is it because it wasn't there or they were trying to hide it? And if they were trying to hide it so that other teams wouldn't be able to see, then shit, missing Keenan Allen these past couple weeks really is bad for the team. And hopefully, I don't know, I think he may be back. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but Hopefully he is because they really are going to need him back because on the flip side, you have the Los Angeles Rams who right now have got to be feeling themselves. They have got to be in the, uh, the, the, the best <laughs> mental mind state that they possibly could be because a lot of people wrote them off uh, <laughs> during, uh, during last week. I think you and I both picked the Niners. But, man, Sean McVay said – I got you an apology. I wasn't really familiar with your game. And he put that <laughs> in quotes and said, I want everyone to now repeat it back to me. Because he said and, – and I was saying this on the stream. Um, they probably came to him and said, you know, we've got Demarcus Robinson, Tyler Johnson, Jordan Whittington. Do you think we should sign a wide receiver, like, just to help us out while – Puka's on IR and Cooper's, uh, you know, uh, this this injury that that Cooper has. And Sean McVay, being Sean McVay, looked at them dead in the eye and said, "If I can beat the Niners with just Kyron Williams, it's that much cooler." And then he walked out of the room. <laughs> like that. And that's literally what happened. That offense moved through Kyron Williams. They threw the ball to those wide receivers just when they needed to. But everything pretty much was Kyron Williams, five yards. Kyron Williams, seven yards. Kyron Williams, eight yards. Uh, Matt Stafford throws to Kyron Williams for six yards. And it was those little things, those little moments. And the crazy thing is, yes, the Niners injured. You know, no Debo Samuel, uh, no uh, Kittle. Kittle. Um You've got all you've really got is Juwan Jennings and uh, and Brandon Ayuk and yes Jordan Mason has looked really good but Brock Purdy throws like eighty five touchdowns in one game to Juwan Jennings yeah. somebody somebody uh, Bleacher Report uh, betting put up a, a a slip that I swear to God is fake 
where somebody put like a, some relatively low amount on Juwan Jennings getting 100 yards and three touchdowns, and of course it catches. I'm like, this is complete fake. But yeah. you know, like, how many people actually thought that well, that was what was going to happen? And they still lose the game. These Rams are absolutely on top of the world. And I, you know, the 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 Bears' strength is the secondary. I don't know if they can stop Kyron Williams. Yeah. And and that's really all the Rams need. The Rams are the underdogs, but I'm taking the Rams in this one. This is probably the worst home game for the Bears ever. Because you <laughs> I, I, like, and honestly, the Rams, if they can get through the fact that they have to travel, they're going to Chicago, they're playing outdoors. And then I remember, oh yeah, Matthew Stafford's used to Chicago. He's played yeah. there. He played there yeah. so many times in his career. It won't phase him as much. Kyron Williams, Notre Dame kid. He played in Illinois. He knows what it's like playing. It's not even going to be that cold, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's like one of those things where it's like, this is the worst home game for the Bears because Sean McVay is a way better head coach than Eber Plus. Like, I'm a big McVay truther. And also, oh, man, uh, who's the offensive coordinator? Oh, Shane Waldron. Who, who did Shane Waldron learn under? Oh, Sean McVay. McVay knows every little pat because this is the McVay coaching tree McVay does what Shanahan did grabs a bunch of assistants builds them up within the tree if you're the d-line coach you become a different type of coach then you learn all the positions then you become their dc and you work with all the other coordinators he's just so smart when it comes to building his coaching staff the defensive coordinator of the rams is probably familiar with what, what Shane Waldron wants to run by the way Shane Waldron was on the Seahawks beforehand McVay knows what the Seahawks like to run. He has not shown anything on this Bears offense that will work. And the Rams are just one of those teams they'll keep fighting. And, and honestly, this just depends on how the home crowd is because that home crowd is not going to be happy if Caleb Williams has another bad game like he did the first two weeks. Yes, he had the yardage uh, week three. But they, I think they, the Bears fans really want a big win. I don't think it's going to come. I think it's going to be another good stack game for Caleb Williams. Uh, but I think the Rams come in and they win a close one in Chicago. I think they're going to win a close one in this one for sure. So, funnily enough, actually, holy shit. Uh, you're shit, man. I didn't even know this. I actually, I, I don't, I don't, I never, I never interacted with this individual. But the Rams defensive coordinator went to my high school at the same time I did. He oh, wow. He graduated in 2004. I graduated from there in 2006. He is Chris Shula. And if that name is familiar, it's because he's the son of Dave Shula and the grandson of Don Shula. And from 2019, uh, 2017 onwards, he has been with the Rams. From 2017 to 2018, assistant linebackers coach. 2019 to 2020, outside linebackers coach. 2021, linebackers coach. 2022, pass game coordinator and defensive backs coach. 2023 pass rush coordinator and linebackers coach. And from this year onwards, defensive coordinator. So li- quite literally proving your point mm-hmm. about what McVay does, about moving individuals around on the on the, on the the staff to learn different positions and learn how to coach up different positions. And then you get the head job underneath McVay. And it's very possible this guy could become a head coach down the road. Yeah, but uh, is, we're, we're, uh, you, you know who also was on, with the Rams for 2017 to 2020? Shane Waldron. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm just saying, like, like to me, when you are familiar with a certain coach, it makes it so much easier for you because you know what they would like to call. And Waldron's going to be overthinking. He's going to overthink because he knows McVay knows his system, and that's that's a thing that's going to happen in this game. And I, the Rams, they will always play above themselves because McVay is just a good. Like I, I, I hate the people that are against McVay. Like I, I don't understand how you can hate this guy. This guy literally finds ways to just do good every fucking season, and it's just like how, <laughs> like he's a Super Bowl winning head coach. He's probably uh, like I, this may be a hot take, probably the best Super Bowl winning head coach in the league. That's not Andy Reid. Besides Andy Reid, who else is there besides McVay? Doug McCar- Doug Peterson's not good right now. Mike McCarthy, we don't know. I mean, I, I, technically speaking, probably Sean Payton, but I would remove him from the conversation. Yeah, no, he, he's, he's still building his roster. He's still building the roster. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, Todd Bowles, know. I guess he counts as a Super Bowl coach because he won one as a DC with Tampa. But I don't think he's better than McVay. Uh, yeah, I don't think there is one. Yeah, besides Andy, Andy Reid's obviously the cream of the crop. But would you would you say could we say John Harbaugh? Not now, no. That's fair. I, I think McVay is better than Harbaugh. I mean, Mike Tomlin and Harbaugh, like they made their Super Bowls in 20, 2000. Like last Super Bowl appearance for Tomlin was what two thousand ten, and then yeah. for Harbaugh two thousand twelve. So yeah. They haven't made they haven't made it back since. Like yes, they have a Super Bowl win, but I don't think they're better than McVay currently. I mean, I wouldn't say they're better after last week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think, I think the thing with McVay is he's very good at, at trusting what he has. Like he, he knows right. what he, what he has, and he works with it. And yeah, players will get in the doghouse with him. And yeah, maybe he will like make quarterbacks feel bad and bad of themselves, like he did with Jared Goff and stuff. Like maybe he gets frustrated a little bit easy, but when it comes to you know having his players fight the Rams are always fighting like minus the Cardinals game. They're always a team that will fight. So, yeah. So we are both in agreement there with the uh, Rams picking up the win as the away team, which turns us to an NFC clash staying in the NFC. We have the Buccaneers hosting the Philadelphia Eagles. I don't, you know, and we've said this, I, I said, said this at the top, this has been a weird season so far, and there are certain teams we don't know what to make of them. I don't know what to make of this Eagles team. Because <laughs> if it wasn't for that late game, very late game interception, there was a very good chance that the Eagles dropped that game to the Saints. And because it, it was, I mean, it was 15-12. Yeah. It was the end score. A field goal would have tied it up, and they go to overtime, and who knows in that situation who wins in overtime. But they did get the interception. I don't know how often the uh, the Eagles can count upon luck in games. They win this. They win. They win by a field goal the week prior. They win by one point the week prior. They win by five points, and part of why they win. I mean, granted, it would have taken some magic, but it's Jordan Love getting injured. Yeah. So this is an interesting one because they're facing a Buccaneers team that is pretty on the ball. Uh, they are that, you know, yes, they lost to the Broncos, which arguably they should not have lost. You could say maybe it was a little bit of a trap game. You could say uh, Todd Bowles, you know, wanted to blitz too much because rookie quarterback, all that fun stuff. Sean Payton also is like seven and zero against uh, Todd Bowles ever since Bowles became the uh, coach of the of the Buccaneers. But the Buccaneers aren't a bad team, and no. are they going to make the same mistakes again and again? I don't know. Is this a situation where they're if they get their tackle back, are they going to be taking seven sacks? I don't think so. Not from a team that doesn't blitz in the first place, playing much more uh, coverage because a Vic Fangio, which is so uh, Vic, a Vic Fangio uh, defense, which I think is pretty interesting because Vic Fangio was a pretty good blitzer when he was mm -hmm. DC for uh, the Bears, and he had yeah. blitz packages when he was head coach of the Broncos. So the fact that they don't really blitz at all and they have one of the lower blitz rates I think is pretty interesting. Um, but even without that tackle, they're not going to blitz. They, it, and, it's, and it's weird because you would think you have – you went and you go and draft all these Georgia players. Are, yeah. you, are you not going to blitz? <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the Georgia – Kirby Smart, one thing I would know about Kirby Smart at Georgia, he loves to blitz. Oh, because he was the <laughs> Alabama – he was like the Alabama D.C. for like ever. And I think he was just waiting for a top end SEC job like Georgia to open up for him to go to, and it'd be classic third and six. You knew Alabama was sending the fucking house. They would have everyone on the line, and it would just be like, and the commentators knew it. And for whatever reason, it would always get home. And very, very weird by Fangio not calling blitzes at all. For me. I think this game is dependent on AJ Brown being back. Yes. 
if AJ Brown is back, the Eagles are winning this handily. If AJ Brown is not back, it becomes super toss up to me because yeah. Devonta Smith is arguably the strongest wide receiver two in the league. Like you can make an argument for the Chris Godwins of the world. You know, there are other uh, Waddle. I mean, granted, not right now with quarterback play. There are <laughs> some strong wide receiver twos out there. Jalen Naylor, Quentin Johnson. Is- Quentin Johnson. <laughs> Wait, is he, is he technically the, the wide receiver two? Is Palmer who's yeah. slotted as yeah. the one? Wow. Yeah. Uh, he's, our, he's our wide receiver two. <laughs> I'm calling he's three. Uh, Come on. You, can, you know, um, if, if both of them were back, obviously I would say it was, it's Puka Nakua, not, uh, not Devonta Smith. But um, this is a – you know, I can't really think of that many teams right now that have a better wide receiver two than Devonta Smith. And the problem is he's being forced to be the wide receiver one. And yeah. we talked about this after last week where they weren't really using Dallas Goddard, and I guess they hurt us because they did have Dallas Goddard more involved in the game. But ultimately, even with A.J. Brown in, this is an offense that runs through Saquon Barkley. Yeah, he's looking. I don't there. know why, but the over-under on Saquon Barkley touchdowns back in you know months ago was 6.5. It was negative 112, but that was the line. I took that immediately. <laughs> like I was I was like yeah. he's, there's no way Saquon Barkley with the best O line he's ever had in his entire life uh except maybe when he was in college uh is not getting over seven touchdowns. He's already at four and we're in week four. Yeah. So that that bet looks like it's it should pay off. Uh, barring some kind of freak injury, which is probably why that line was six and a half. It was counting more on Barkley not staying healthy throughout the season. Being available. Right. And this is a situation where I don't know whether or not Vita Vea is back. And if Vita Vea isn't back, the Eagles are not going to have the problem with running the ball the way that Denver had the problem running the ball. Because Saquon Barkley is better than Javante Williams, Jaleel McLaughlin, Tyler Beatty, and whoever my art uh, running back four is combined. So I'm taking the Eagles on this one. <laughs> I'd love to be surprised, but uh, I'm taking the Eagles on this one. Yeah, I think the Eagles are just a better team. Plus there's revenge factor, you know, wanting to get revenge after that divisional loss to the Buccaneers. Uh, the Buccaneers, like, obviously they were, they look good, but I feel like uh, if a, competent and good enough defense is against baker he just overthinks like he just he just does that like the one thing the broncos did really well they forced baker out of the pocket i feel baker i do not know why baker thinks he's some good off schedule quarterback he was in college but in the nfl he has not been good off schedule like when he rolls out and does these plays not in the pocket his passer rating is atrocious and when he's able to sit in the pocket not have to scramble out and do like the college Baker Mayfield plays, that's when he gets in trouble. And I think the Eagles, they will be able to get to Baker Mayfield, force Baker Mayfield out of the pocket. Cause I saw that in that Broncos game, watching the tape, I'm just like, man, when Baker gets out of the pocket, he is just not good. He's just not a good quarterback outside of the pocket, inside the pocket. You give Baker time to just stay in the pocket. He, he is really good, but I think the Eagles, they'll make sure that he cannot get those big chunk plays to Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. They will get one or two, but not on a consistent level that the the Buccaneers offense like to like to throw it to. And the Buccaneers defense just being banged up and don't really have the depth pieces to replace those banged up players. Like that's where sometimes roster construction comes into a big play where like, hey, you may be missing this player, but do you have someone that's like a light version of him that can replace it? But, you know, Vita Vea's borderline Hall of Fame talent, like pretty hard to replace that guy. And uh, Winfield Jr., also pretty fucking good player himself. Hard to replace that guy. So those are hard players to replace, but you do have to have the, the depth and the pieces to replace said players in, the, in, in football games. That's, that's, that's just the NFL. I don't care what anyone says. Injuries, to me, injuries are not really an excuse. The Rams are on what, like a fucking practice squad tackle, and they came back against the Niners? <laughs> like, I, I'm just saying, like, I get people say about injuries, but it's, roster construction is a part of the NFL. And I'll talk about this more when we get to the Chargers as well. But 
you cannot make excuses. Oh, well, we were missing this player, that player, that player, da-da-da. No. Everyone plays hurt. Everyone plays injured. Did you create a roster that can win no matter what? And I don't think the Buccaneers have that roster that can win no matter what. It's more of a roster of guys that, like, you know, if your best players are available, running back, they have no problem. Bucky Irving came in and took Rashad White's job pretty much. Like, he pretty much yeah, just told Rashad yeah. White, yeah, sorry, bud, I, yeah, I'm – <laughs> it's my it's my ball now. Like you know, he he did a great job, but yeah, no, the Buccaneers. If I I think Baker's going to have another bad Baker game, and I think that the Eagles will win this game, and it's the revenge factor. And I think they're going to force Baker out of the pocket, make Baker make mistakes, which leads you to winning football games. Yeah, and you know, to to to, to your point about replacement players, and to your point about people having to step up even if they're not able to flush Baker out of the pocket, the Denver defense is, it's good. Yeah. It's, it's sneaky good, but their secondary is still growing. Like Riley Moss is still a growing cornerback and he's showing that he can be CB2 to, uh, to Pat CB1, but Reed Blankenship, CJ Gardner Johnson, even if Darius Slay isn't there, they've got that rookie in Quinion Mitchell. Yeah. It's it's a full-fledged secondary. Whereas Denver's is, you know, I like PJ Locke. I like Brandon Jones, got that uh, interception, but it's not on the level of this Philadelphia secondary. Yeah. I'm I'm I want to see Evans and Godwin versus this secondary. I mm-hmm. that's gonna be fun. That's gonna be fun to watch. But a game that may not be fun to watch oh god <laughs> and you know i i was really surprised because if we look at at uh at last week the broncos being plus 270 the buccaneers being uh negative 335 and man was this line down here 390 for the bengals off uh and the commanders being plus uh 310 but if there is a line that is ridiculously lopsided Holy shit, dude. Negative 560 to plus 420 for this Niners Patriots game. And that's taking into account the fact that they don't know whether or not Debo's yeah. back. They don't Jibble's know whether Kim's back. back. They've lost, and that's the Niners defense having lost some people too. Man, I don't like I I kind of feel bad for Gerard Mayo, but like at the same time, I don't because I think everybody in the Patriots building understands this Mm -hmm. is a this is this is this is just a rebuild season. This is just uh, let's see what we have with some of these guys. Let's throw some of these rookies into the fire and pray to God that some of them look good enough that we don't have to worry as much about that position. We can focus on the positions where guys don't look good. I don't think there's a way that the Patriots can win this game. No. I, I <laughs> this may be the shortest one that we need to talk about. Uh, the so only I'm way yours, yours accidentally, but I yeah. think you're going. You, to you, 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 yeah, you could just you could just put Niners now. <laughs> the only way the Niners lose is if Brandon Staley, defensive genius, decides to do something cute to get the Patriots into the game. That's the only way. Look, Niners <laughs> don't play down to the level of their competition. They're a good football team. It's just yeah. when you also play against another well-coached football team, shit's going to happen. That comeback that happened with the Rams, who was a coach? Sean McVay, not some bum. Uh, Gerard Mayo's still learning to be a head coach in the NFL. He's still learning how to talk to his players as a coach, not as a player. That's one thing that takes time to learn. That's why it, it was weird that he got a head coaching job because I felt the reason why D'Amico Ryan's is doing so well was the fact that he was DC for so many years at uh for so many years and then it was under the Niners that I felt that helped him learn how to be a coach. Jerome Mel just they, it's just Robert Kraft likes the dude. He's like, oh I liked him as a player so I'm gonna make him my coach. Doesn't <laughs> always work out well. Um but yeah no this is just more like the Niners are gonna just obliterate the Patriots. I I don't like like I said it would be a Brandon Staley class if they don't destroy the Patriots, but because of the spread, if the spread is high, still bet the Patriots because I guess everyone that's been a six and a half favorite this year has not covered. Uh, so the favorites have not covered at six and a half. So the, the teams that are not the teams that are 
minus plus six and a half have covered all this year. So if you're someone that bets the spreads, that this might be the one that 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 doesn't cover, but you might want to <laughs> throw some money on it. It, it could happen. <laughs> Crazier things have happened, but we move from the uh from from this probably atrocious game to one that on paper looks really good. Yeah. You have the offensive rookie of the year from 2019, Kyler Murray, armed now with Marvin Harrison Jr., James Conner, Trey Benson's looking pretty good, Trey McBride, Dorch, Michael Wilson, going up against the guy who now is the favorite for the 2024 offensive rookie of the year in Jaden Daniels. And holy shit, the commanders have looked really good. Even when they've lost, they've looked really good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, when they played the Giants, people were making fun of the Giants saying, you know, a team can get two uh, touchdowns and a a field goal and hold their opponents to zero touchdowns and still lose. But we saw on Monday what happens when even a couple of those field goal drives turn into touchdown drives. Yeah. Commanders looked poised. They looked to get like working as a team, as a unit, all of them are bought in to this idea of this kid is the future of commander football in Andover, Maryland, whatever the fuck they play. Uh, Cause it's not actually DC. Um, man, Dan Quinn looking really good as a, as a head coach and Cliff Kingsbury. This is the Cliff Kingsbury revenge game yeah. <laughs> as the, as the offensive coordinator for the Cardinals. And, uh, man, he is, he is, you know, it's, it's crazy. I saw one of the plays that, that play that Ryan Clark wrote down the idea that they were going to do max protect seven guys (laughs) to defend Jaden Daniels and just have two, (laughs) two (laughs) fucking receivers go out. And he's just like, yeah, Terry will get it. And Terry gets it. And it's, it's like, it's, it's. We talk about playing with house money. This is a, a, a example of he's not a backup quarterback, but the commanders are playing with house money because nobody expects them to win. Nobody expects yeah. them to be good because the team itself is so terrible. That's usually why you have the second overall pick. The Bears only had it because it was the Panthers. Yeah, they, 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 they only had the first. <laughs> so this is a it's it's a fun one. This is I, I, I said this last week and it was also a Cardinals game. Uh, but this is the one I'm, I'm kind of most looking forward to now because I just want to see what nonsense Jaden Daniels is going to come up with to get the ball down the field to yeah. Terry McLaurin and to Deami Brown. Um, I'm surprised they're not using Ben Sinat a little bit more, uh, but Zach Ertz has looked really good turning back, uh, turning back the clock. They have Brian Robinson looking really great now. A question will be there. Austin Eckler, I think it was a concussion. Yeah. Uh, will we clear concussion protocol in time for the game? More often than not, players don't, which, I mean, first things first, take care of yourselves, be healthy. Yeah. And, I, you know, maybe you can speak on a little bit better, but to me, Austin Eckler has always been a guy that has uh, prioritized his health so he's not – I mean, like, I'm not saying he's not going to be a guy who's willing to play a game, but at the same time, it's not – it's like if this was week 16, week 15, week 17, you're like there's a seeding question, I think Eckler's like, yeah, if I'm cleared, I'm playing. I think this could be a situation where he's like, you know, I, I may I may take a, I may take the week simply yeah. because I'm concerned about my long-term longe- uh, longevity. He knows he's not that long for the league. Uh, but even without Eckler, I think that the commanders have a really good chance of winning this game simply because these are Jaden Daniels has this weird ability to make magic. And Romeo would say, I've, I've been watching this for years. That's what Romeo would say. But for the rest of the NFL, there's still a little bit of catching up to do. The yeah. question is going to be, is it enough to stop the fourth overall pick? Marvin Harrison Jr. Because if there's one thing we did see, uh, Mm -hmm. it was that Jamar Chase was able to get open against the commander's secondary. 
I would take the over on Marvin Harrison's yards. <laughs> I would take the over on Kyler Murray's yards. Uh, this could be a shootout, a wild shootout, uh, because the Cardinals are also missing or could be missing Buda Baker. And that guy has been the core of this Cardinals yeah. defense for a very long time. I think this is uh, similar to Monday night's game with the Bengals. I think it kind of comes down to who has the ball last. And it's and just one final stand from that defense, what the, the opposing defense, can they overcome it? Can they not? That's what it's going to come down to. But for me, I'm going to take the Cardinals simply because I trust Kyler more at this point, and I trust yeah. Marvin more at this point than I trust Jaden and Terry. However, I am more than happy to be wrong on this pick simply because – it means that commander's football is back to me. If they can go up against an equally high powered offense, they did it uh, uh, on, on, on Monday with a returning T Higgins, but that could be an outlier. That could be a one-off. If you show it to me again, especially uh, uh, back-to-back weeks to me, commander's football is back. We can finally have serious conversations about, the idea that it's not just going to be the Eagles or the Cowboys trading the, the division championship back and forth. And that's something I think is just great for football. And yeah. then, well, I feel bad if, if that does happen, I just, again, I'll feel bad for Malik neighbors, but, but, but what do you got in this one? Man, I, I love the story, but with these two quarterbacks, obviously, you know, I have a huge man crush on Tyler Murray, one of my favorites to watch that's in the true. league. Uh, both these guys. Though you, well, you did draft Anthony Richardson in the dynasty. Yeah, yeah but it was Big Tony. I love Big Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, Kyle Murray is not a dynasty guy at this point. Like you know, you, if you get him, you get him. You know, it's like one of those. Oh, if I get Kyler, I get Kyler. But both these guys in college went to very hype programs. ASC was on the rise when Jaden Daniels went there. Kyler Murray went to Texas A and M. Both ended up transferring and both got lambasted for transferring to the schools they transferred to, acting like they're quitters, they're not good leaders, da da da. And then both went on to win Heisman trophies for their respective That's schools. Right. They're both Heisman winners, too. Yeah, both Heisman winners. Yeah. Uh, I think the Cardinals will win this game, mainly because I think there's a lot of familiarity. Uh, if Mike Sarensaw is going against uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. again, he's going to be like, fuck, I got to guard this guy again. Tired of this motherfucker. Been guarding him since college. Uh, but I do think the Cardinals are just an overall better team than the Commanders. Like, Cardinals, it, it just depends because they're kind of Cincinnati Bengalish where they will play down to the level of their competition or they won't play up when they need to play up. But, man, if the Cardinals can just get Harrison Jr. rolling, Trey McBride rolling against this Washington secondary that's still very, very shaky, yeah. I think they can win this game. And it's also, too, can the commanders keep up the pace that they were doing with the Bengals? Cause right. I don't know. I don't know if they're going to be scoring touchdowns like this, like every single time, like we saw against the giants, they struggled to get into the end zone and against the Bengals, they were able to get into the end zone. Will they be able to get into the end zone? Like this is another one where like I, I talked about this last week. I said, maybe they tell Kingsbury drop some of your best plays to get us touchdowns against the Cincinnati Bengals team. Cause this win will mean more for us in the long run than yeah. like any other win because it's a primetime game, Monday night football against a team that is well-constructed in the Bengals, that have Super Bowl aspirations, fought for a Super Bowl two years ago. Like that that's a team that you want to beat to show like, hey, there's a bright future here in Washington. It's just overall the team's construction is still kind of weak. Like it's still like a team where they're still building and learning. And, you know, I, I always have the rookie QB theory when the rookie QB has a great primetime game. The next game, they absolutely just come out <laughs> flat. And so that's another reason why. Like, I like Jaden Daniels. I think Jaden Daniels is great. He's fun to watch. But I do have the rookie QB theory in there. And the primetime game proved it to me. He looked great in primetime. But in a game, not a lot of people are going to be watching. Eh, yeah, he'll it, it it, it still have his rushing yards. He'll do fine. But that Cardinals defense is still pretty darn solid under Gannon. So, yeah, I, I think the Cardinals will win this one. I think they're a more complete football team and man arizona you're getting your money's worth like freaking what like this isn't your third straight home game like <laughs> jesus what the hell like they get three straight home games like rise up red sea man rise up yeah red dude, dude they, they literally said they literally said yeah we'll apply you to buffalo but then your next three games all at home buddy <laughs> it's like okay and you know 
when the when 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 the cats away, the mice will play. Is the is the old saying? And uh, if the if the Rams are away, there's somebody else that that seems to play sometimes in the Rams house. Yeah, that is the Chargers hosting the Kansas City Chiefs and. If there was a line that should be, I feel bad saying this, man. If there was a line that should be close to that Patriots Niners line, it feels like this one because the yeah. Chargers have Justin Herbert reaggravating that in, the his injury, leaving the game, Taylor Heineke coming in, not playing well, and then you lose Derwin James on a suspension. For uh, unsportsmanlike conduct, uh, apparently Cam Hayward not facing the same issue no. uh, in in life. Um, we have been treated over the years to very competitive, very entertaining Chargers Chiefs games. Oh yeah, Th these are fun games. These are yeah. these are never bad games. They're I so don't fun. know, but I don't know if that if this one <laughs> is following that script, man. This and you know I I really feel bad. Uh, this could be the Travis Kelsey uh, return to form game. Oh, who beats us? I, I, there's going to be so many opportunities. I don't know how, one, the Chargers defense is going to be able to stifle the Chiefs because they're going to be on the field so much because the Chargers offense yeah. has to go up against this Chiefs defense. And yeah. the Chiefs defense has been playing so well. You know, uh, one thing that a lot of people uh, talk about is, you know, you get a franchise quarterback, you get an absolute stud, and your offense looks so great. But one thing that goes under the radar about that and is not talked about as much is even even if you have to pay that person, because the Chiefs have paid Pat, but even if you have to pay, pay that person, the defense knows that they can play, they can do what they want because their quarterback will be able to bail them out should they oversell to try to stop whatever it is the opposing team is good at. And you and I have seen this year after year after year, two times a year for both of us. Yep. This Chiefs defense is they're just playing so free. They just don't give a shit. They're, they're mm -hmm. just they're like they're like it doesn't matter Hollywood Brown isn't there yet. It doesn't matter that uh Rasheed Rice uh you know is is uh, sorry that Pacheco is is out on IR. It doesn't matter. Why? Because the only not, the only thing that matters is who's behind center. Is it 1-5? Yes, we're probably winning this game. Yeah. And the Chiefs are on such autopilot until it gets cold. That they just don't give a shit. Um, I, I think you're doing the same thing here, but man, I, I hope it's I hope it's closer. I hope it's closer than what I think it's going to be. Yeah, I, I think this line is reflecting that Herbert isn't going to play because if yeah. Herbert was playing, the line would be closer. I don't want Herbert playing this game to be honest. Like, I, I get it's an early divisional game. I wouldn't want Chris Jones trying to kill him either. Yeah, like we're missing both of our tackles. Uh, Rashawn Slater might be out, and also Joe All is definitely going to be out for a couple weeks, which which is a huge blow to the Chargers. And your offense is going to be mostly one-dimensional with Heineke. Heineke does have the ability to pull off the weird win here and there. This is not the game where he's going to pull off the weird win. Even if Herbert was healthy and we had a healthy tackles, I would still be choosing the Chiefs here. Because the Chiefs just own us in SoFi. Like, the Chiefs always find a way to beat it. It's funny. Every time when we beat the Chiefs, it's an arrowhead. Thursday night. <laughs> I, I, it, 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 if you look at the Chargers history, you'll be like, yeah, they have a lot of wins on the Chiefs. We're one of the few teams that can beat the Chiefs in arrowhead. It's like the weirdest thing. We had that Thursday night game where uh, Mike Williams caught the game-winning uh, two-point conversion. Herbert's first big win over Mahomes was an arrowhead. Like, we just do well in Arrowhead uh, compared to that SoFi. All our bad losses, I was there live for one of them, was when we <laughs> lost to the Chiefs. We were up. We scored a touchdown with, like, a minute 30 left, and that was too much time for Patty Mahomes and the Chiefs to, to get to get down there. So, yeah, uh, I, I'm just interested to see how the defense looks just for the first quarter against Mahomes to see, like, how they're – when they're fresh. And then this, this is a game where I just know, that like, the Chargers are going to lose this game. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing Charger fans saying, oh, we're, we're, we're screwed, we're fucked, injuries. Guys, 
this roster is poorly constructed right now. So just stop making excuses. It's, Next man up. Next man up. It's a rebuilding thing for them, and like I don't. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm not. I don't blame them for anything that they're that they're dealing with. Yeah. Like and look, Derwin James. Everyone's saying that suspension was bullshit. It's on Derwin James. Like this guy has had multiple unnecessary roughness penalties throughout the year. Some of them not warranted. I I will say that. But when you have, I believe he had 11 last year. You had nine the year before that. Yeah, they're going to fucking suspend you. That's that's way above the limit. And I'm a Derwin James defender. I love Derwin James. But you can't be making stupid fucking plays. That's just <laughs> it. Like, the play against Friar Moot, that's just idiotic. Like, you did not need to tackle him helmet to helmet. Like, I'm sorry. That's on you as a player. Yeah. And that's on you. And so I don't feel any sympathy. Like, Charger fans are going to be like, Oh, da, 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 da. like you can make all the excuses you want, but at the end of the day, that's on Derwin James. Derwin James did this to himself. And the reason why we're going to lose this game is because we just don't have the Jim Harbaugh roster yet. Like I think a lot of Charger fans need to just understand that Joel Ortiz and Jim Harbaugh will build this roster up. We're going to perform above the expected. I will not be surprised if somehow, some way early in this game, it's fucking close because it's Jim fucking yeah. Harbaugh. Yeah. Like it's Jim Harbaugh. Like you just gotta trust. But once Harbaugh gets his roster, then injuries won't matter. Cause like I, I, we're gonna be talking about a team later on, the Ravens. How many times has Ronnie Stanley missed games? But yet Lamar Jackson yeah. still plays well right. without right. a franchise left tackle. Like you gotta just trust the process. Pipkins, he'll either play left tackle or right. Uh, if Slater is not fully healthy to play this game, and I don't want him to play this game, it's so early in the season, and I'm not expecting the Chargers to be a uh, playoff team if we get into the playoffs it's because jim harbaugh is just a lunatic and that, that, that's it's literally the reason being but either you put si siler as, at left or right and then you put pipkins at left or right and you and siler did well when slater got hurt the, his rookie season at left tackle but yeah no the chiefs are winning this game it's just more of like what i want to see is how does the defense look but yeah no the chiefs um they're they're on autopilot like you could just tell watching that atlanta game they, yeah. they're just they're just on autopilot it, if this was it, i'll laugh though if this is a bad mahomes game if, if mahomes somehow j <laughs> just plays bad against this shitty chargers team uh like well not the defense is not shitty but right. against the 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 offense the the taylor heineke most likely led offense like yeah no th this will be fucking hilarious but yeah no herbert like, I get people want Herbert to play. I get Herbert wants to play. Herbert is just a terminator. He wants to play through these injuries. Herbert, I saw you play with broken ribs. I've seen you play with broken hand. I get it. You want to play. I do not think any less of you. But this is weak motherfucking four. And, and this is what I want to say, too. If the Chargers truly believed in Heineke, like, we traded for Heineke. We didn't have him on the roster. We traded for him. That means you have some belief that this guy can be a backup for you. Trust the backup in this situation. Don't, this is not, like for the Chargers. Is this really a must win game? I know we were talking earlier, must win for the Packers and the Vikings. Maybe that's a little bit more must win. But for, if you're the Chargers and you're looking at your record, you're two and one. You beat two bad teams. You lost to the Steelers, but you get the bye week next week. Like, you have your bye next week. Why wouldn't you take advantage of the fact that you're going to get a bye in another week of Herbert being healthy? I like, mean, to be fair. Getting healthy. To be fair, bro. They gave the Falcons a six-round pick in 2025. We still trade. We still gave up a pick to trade for him. It's a six-round pick next year. Yeah, we still gave up a pick. We still <laughs> gave up something to get him. Like, if, we, if, you're, if you're trading for someone when there's other people on the available on free agency – you, you you obviously believe in them. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I could care less. I, I think Heineke should start. I think the Chargers should be playing. Um, <laughs> I think the Chargers should not be playing Herbert. But the Chiefs will win this game. Uh, they they just look good. Uh, you know what's, on autopilot. So. You know what's crazy? You know what's ridiculous? If if I was the Chargers, I don't even know if I would want J.K. Dobbins to play this game. Because I'd be like, because I'd be like, if Gus Edwards goes down, okay. But if J.K. Dobbins goes down, that's yeah. kind of the offense right now. Like, there, yes, you're getting Quentin Johnson making catches because Jim Harbaugh probably threatened to kill him. But at the same time, it's moving because of Dobbins. Yeah, and yeah. that guy's. I think. I think they will let Dobbins play because, like you know, 
it, that's he's our offense. He's going to be our offense for most of the time. So you got to show some competitiveness. So if Dobbins doesn't play, the league will ask the Chargers, "Hey, are you tampering to lose here?" Like, <laughs> like they, they, they'll ask some questions. So yeah, no, I, I think they should be like, "Yeah, we're trying to help." The, the the Falcons with that six round pick, so it's a little yeah. bit higher. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, in two thousand, I right, dude, that pick, that hey, six round picks. Though some 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 good players come in the six round. Stephon Diggs, like look, Tom Brady. Tom Brady came in the six round. Oh, Who knows? Okay. All, right. Like, all right, all right, all right. I, I, I'm just saying, if you went out of your way to trade for Heineke, you should just trust in him when Herbert is hurt, because that's the reason why you traded for a backup, right? Because in situations Herbert gets hurt. You want at least a competent quarterback back there. And I, I, look, Heineke, he's not good. But he does pull off Heineke things. Like, he will pull off the weird Heineke game where you're like, oh. Like, he had one throw in the Steelers game where I said, dang, that was actually pretty good. Like, I'm, I'm cool with Heineke. It's better than Easton Stick. I'll, I'll say that much. I have more faith with Heineke than Easton Stick. Like, Easton Stick's trash. Heineke looks competent at least. But, yeah, no, I, I, I think the Chiefs are winning easily, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, um, we, you know, you talk about trading for a player, particularly trading for a quarterback. A lot of people were, you know, surprised maybe by how good CJ Stroud looked his rookie season, but there's a big reason as to why CJ Stroud looked good during that rookie season. And it's not because CJ Stroud isn't a good quarterback. He is a good quarterback. He's a great quarterback. One of the top quarterbacks in the league. But as good as a quarterback can be, you got to surround them with talent. And one of the reasons why the, the, the Texans were able to surround him with talent was because they got a whole bunch of first-round picks from a team up in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Or a quarterback named Deshaun Watson. And that trade has looked absolutely fucking terrible for the Browns because not only has did they give up all that to get Watson, but then they signed him to, at the time, the largest contract in history that was fully also guaranteed. fully guaranteed. I still think it's and, the worst contract because of that. It's fully guaranteed. This guy's going to make his money regardless. <laughs> and it's like, what do, you, what do you do? Because Deshaun Watson – I. I don't think anybody would say he's lived up to even half of the bargain. He's either been hurt or he's played terrible. And he's starting here and there to put together flashes of what he was when he was with the Texans. But it seems as though that ship has sailed. And it's terrible because they are wasting what few years Amari Cooper has left. I don't care as much about Jerry Judy because fuck him. But, <laughs> but, you know, it sucks for Jerry Judy in a certain way. But, man, this Browns team should have rolled over the Giants. And, yes, you know, you've got that incredible defense. And, yes, the Giants were just like, well, Malik Neighbor, he's down there somewhere. But they should have beaten up on the Giants. But now they have an opportunity – to sort of right the ship against the Raiders. <laughs> the Las Vegas Raiders are, I don't even know. You know, if we're talking about them wasting the few years of Amari Cooper, what the Browns are doing. The Raiders are absolutely wasting <laughs> the remainder of Devontae Adams's career. And if you watched the Netflix receivers, you would understand why Devontae Adams is pissed the fuck off. Because not only did he specifically choose the Raiders because of Derek Carr, he chose them because he knew what he could do with Derek Carr. It wasn't just, hey, I can play with my old college quarterback. It was we played really damn well together. Oh, and they're they're one of the best, uh, in my opinion, one of the best receiver. To quarterback combos in college history what well, like top top 15 like they were so good together like i would watch fresno state games because of them i would be like oh i gotta watch car and <laughs> adams they're they're so they were so good together and now you've got this and you and, and they've got this defense that's you know they've got max crosby who i'm already so in tune with that we're putting on the same clothes to come to games with i think this is a good fit 
And what do the Raiders do? They go, oh yeah, uh, Derek. Car- no, no, no. We're gonna we're gonna ship him out of here. We're we're just gonna release him. <laughs> we're not even gonna like. We're not even gonna tr- trade or anything like that. I think he had a no trade clause, maybe. Uh, but like, we're not even gonna bother with any of that shit. No, no, no. Just Derek, you're out of here. They're going to try with Jimmy Garoppolo, which. I get it. Like, I understand that on paper, Jimmy Garoppolo, Niners, did very well, got to the Super Bowl and all that. But, I mean, are you Kyle Shanahan? No. So I don't think you're going to be able to pull off what happens there. Then you let Josh Jacobs leave. And the way Jacobs left told me that Jacobs was like, this is an absolutely dysfunctional facility. Organization. Organization, everything. Devontae Adams has to fight. Uh, accusations that he wants to to leave, he wants to be traded, when I am pretty sure, especially now, he absolutely does. Um, And now you have the head coach of this team talking about in the press conference that it he felt as though players went into business for themselves. Now, that's... I was trying to figure out who he's talking about because Gardner Minshew has no reason to not play well because he doesn't want to get replaced by AOC. Maybe Max Crosby, but Crosby seems like he's too much of a competitor, too much of that dog in him to want to take plays off or anything like that. So really, it's got to be Devontae Adams. Jacoby Myers doesn't seem to be complaining about anything ever, so it's like you barely hear that dude's name. Yeah. So it's got to be Devontae. And it's like, I understand Devontae's frustrations and I understand his perspective, but it's like, bro, they're not going to trade you to the Jets. Because even if they want, even if they were going to trade you, they're going to trade you as a punishment for, because they don't want you anymore because you're being an asshole. That's the only way you're going to be able to get the trade. And if you're, if that's how you're going to get the trade, they're not going to do something that's beneficial for you. They're just not. Now, maybe Devontae Adams doesn't give a shit, and he's like, just get me out of here anywhere but Las Vegas. And honestly, I wouldn't blame him. This is a a game, and it's crazy because this line is so close. The line I don't think is close because the teams are competitive. The line is so close because it's like we don't know which team is going to fuck up. That, to me, is the (laughs) issue here. I'm taking the Browns simply because I think the Browns have the better defense. And yes, they just let Daniel Jones and uh, and the Giants like go all over them. But I don't as 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 bad as Daniel Jones is. I think Daniel Jones is better than Gardner Minshew or Aiden O'Connell and Malik Neighbors, Devonte Adams. That's irrelevant because to me, because the quarterback is way worse than yeah. Daniel Jones. And on the other side, to your point earlier, Singletary has run very well, and the. The Raiders can't figure out whether they want it to be Alexander Madison or Zamir White, and neither of them have looked good enough to be on the level of Devin Devin Singletary. So I'm taking the Browns' defense. I think this is a get-right game for the Browns. They bounce back. What do you take? I'm with you all the way with the Browns. I think the Raiders, like, I don't know, they just look so dysfunctional. And the Raiders, they love going in cocky. Like Like, I talked about Bengals. They'll go down to their level of competition. It's not even going down to the level of competition. They just play cocky. They just act like they're better than anyone else. They don't. They don't. They don't get get the idea of hey, we got to be humbled a little bit. And if that Carolina game did not humble you, this Browns loss should humble you. And honestly, I want to know the odds of a fight happening. I think there's going to be a fight on the field more than anything else. I mean, the, the, these teams are both frustrated with everything. They, they hate everything that's going on. Um, Devontae Adams was hilarious. So every Tuesday, uh, Kay Adams does her show up in Adams. It's yeah. Adams Tuesday with Devontae Adams. I was <laughs> looking at Devontae Adams' face the whole time when Kay, you know, very sweet girl. Not a lot of players can get mad at her if she asks a question. She yeah. asked, what, what did AP mean by players going into business? And the way Devontae Adams looked, he was like, well, you know, Kay, it's just one of those scenes. He's right, you know, got to open up, do your thing. His body language was saying he was talking about me. Yeah. I went into business for myself. And <laughs> honestly, Devontae Adams is just waiting. I think the reason why the Raiders are waiting, because I think there's a trade kicker if they trade him before the trade deadline. Like if you trade 
Devonte Adams. I think there's like some weird trade kicker that may come in. So I think that's why they're waiting until, uh, what's it called? Us. Yeah, I think I because sometimes when players sign those contracts, if you trade them before the trade deadline or something, there's like a weird payment or something like that. That like something you have to eat a certain amount of their cap and stuff. So that's why I think the Raiders are waiting. I don't think they want to eat whatever kicker comes their way, and especially if they have to trade him to a team that may be over the cap. That's something that could be an issue. So yeah, that'll be. I mean, from what I'm seeing, there's no trade. Okay. There is no no no. There is no no trade clause. Uh, so they can send him anywhere, right? Like they could send yeah. him, to, like pick the shitty. They could send him to the Panthers if they want. Yeah, to. yeah, no, yeah. Like that, that. I think that's the issue is that you know there could be something where it's like Devonte Adams probably has offers, and there's teams that yeah. he doesn't want to go to. Yeah, uh, he he showed an interest in the Panthers last year when they there was hope, and then I I think he's rescinded that. But then you also got to look at the teams that everyone's saying to the Jets. And I'm telling people, I'm like, guys, what do the Jets have that they could afford Devontae Adams? They would have to give up a good player. They can't they – can't, because the, the Raiders are not going to be settling for a second-round pick for Adams. They're going to want a good player back for him. And that's how – and the Raiders, I think, are hard traders. Like, they're, they they want to win the trade. They want to have good trade negotiations. This, this isn't like Bill O'Brien's a coach and he wants uh, – who was that stupid running back that he wanted that he traded DeAndre Hopkins for? <laughs> he, oh. he, yeah. he had that one good season, and he was like, oh, I need this David running Johnson. back. Yeah, he, it's, this is not David Johnson. Like, like you got to be realistic. I know everyone wants Rodgers and Adams, but this is a situation. You got to look at the teams that may be available for him, and I don't think it's any team that's, like, really, really good. It's a team that's receiver needy and a team that has talent that the raiders would be interested in and the I mean, raiders if you're if you're the if you're the jets i i would give up alan lazard in a heartbeat i would no, give up that, that's I, not enough no no i mean I, I would include him i mean they have i'm looking at their their picks right now they have a first a second two thirds a fourth fifth two sixths and then the seventh get a little bit you're not giving you're not going to give up your first for Adams. That would be ridiculous. I would. You know what? I would give up the first. I don't think they would do. I don't think uh, the. I, I forget his. I know his name is Joe. I almost called him Joe Ortiz, but I don't Douglas. think that. Douglas. I don't think. I don't think Douglas would give up a first round pick for. I would. Devontae Adams. I would. Because think like think about it though, right? If you get Devonte Adams, even if you lose Alan Lazard, Devonte Adams, Garrett Wilson, Tyler Conklin. Braylon Allen, Brees Hall. That's going to be a late pick. Yeah, but they, the Jets value first round picks. They've traded for three first round picks uh, in one year. Like they're they're one of those teams they value first round. Honestly, I'll do it, man. If, if there's a team, there's a team that I think would trade a first round pick, and I think Adams would look at that team and say. Yeah, I'll pair up with that guy. I think the Falcons. The Falcons over traded oh, for Drew. Beautiful. Yeah, oh, that, I think the Falcons. Gave up a third for Judon, and he's not even under contract. And yeah. they were like, and they traded a third round pick for Judon. I think they would be a team that that would be they, a fun. That would be fun. And also, you're, if you're the Falcons, you're like, hey, we don't even know if we're going to keep this first round pick because of the, the <laughs> contract tap thing. Might as well get rid of, like, you know, like, would, might as well. if, dude. If if I if, and if, if that happens, and I have a redraft where I have Bowers and uh, Kyle Pitts, I'll trade Kyle Pitts for I don't know anything. Because yeah. if if the Falcons got Devonte Adams and so they have Darnell Mooney, Adams, Drake London, Bijan Robinson, Tyler Algier, they're never throwing a Kyle Pitts. Yeah, because because <laughs> these are the these are like my potential Devonte Adams teams. Like, and why I'm saying they're potential Devonte Adams teams is because they're willing. I think they're willing to give up a pick and a player, and they would want this this guy on their team because they think that oh he will help our quarterback get better. I think it is going to definitely be like the Falcons. Like, I, I honestly, I just think the Jets, unless they give them a godfather offer, like if the Jets give up a lot of picks and a, and a good player, that's when they're going to give them to the Jets. Because also, it's it, there's pettiness too. Like, why would you want to give Devontae Adams to someone right, to, saying, to yeah. make him happy? Like, you're not going to send him to a situation to make him happy and stuff. But I think teams like the Falcons and the Vikings, those are two teams that you could look at and say, okay, they will – Definitely give up capital. I know they just played Jettas. 
but I think the Vikings, if they if they keep going on a run, they could make it make a chance and say, hey, screw it. You know, we could have Jettas and Devontae Adams. Adams' contract is going to run up anyways. It doesn't matter. I can see the commanders also being in play of the saying, you know what? Both. Yeah, because I think the commanders could also be in play saying, hey, young quarterback, scary Terry, you, you know, he's two years left on his contract. Same timeline as Devontae Adams. But if you truly believe in Jaden Daniels, you can go to him. Thankfully, they're division rivals, but the Chiefs would also be involved. But they're division rivals. <laughs> Thankfully. Oh, Thankfully. The, Chief, the, Chiefs, the Chiefs don't need to do shit. They're just waiting for Hollywood Brown to get back. Yeah. She was yeah Hollywood no, but, and worthy. Well, I think, isn't it Hollywood Brown out for the season? He said he's not playing this season. Yeah, but what I'm saying is they don't they don't even care about this season. They're pretty sure they're yeah. going to win. They're pretty sure they're at least and getting then, to the playoffs, and then they're like, "Eh, we'll, we'll we'll keep winning, probably." And then, and then my sleeper team, well, the two sleeper teams are the Steelers and the Jaguars, because we all know the Jaguars they they are desperate to make Trevor Lawrence work, <laughs> and Trevor Lawrence doesn't have a true number one wide receiver, and if you're Devontae Adams and you can convince them, hey, you get to go to Jacksonville. Similar similar situation as Vegas, no state tax. You get to play in Florida, nice warm warm weather. Might convince them to go there. And the Steelers, I think the Steelers are looking at it as like, is Pickens fully developed yet? We don't know. Calvin Austin is like your second option. Prior moved is your second, also your tight end. Adding an Adams could go a long way. I don't think the Steelers would give up the draft capital for Devontae yeah. Adams. But I think the Falcons are the team where I'm like, I could see them saying, here's a first round pick. We want, we want the Monte apps. Dude. I, all I know is when you said the Vikings, if they got Devonte Adams with Jettas, with yeah. Jordan, Addison, with Hawkinson, I'm not talking about this year, next year with JJ McCarthy, dude, that, and, they, and they can afford that. They can afford that. McCarthy's that, on his rookie deal. That's right. That's right. always a why. Because this is what this is the thinking of why Vikings. I know Vikings fans are going to be like, "What the Vikings?" That makes no. It does make sense because the Vikings feel like they have all the other positions filled out. They yeah. have young guys missing on defense. They have their their future franchise quarterback missing on offense. They have a rookie quarter quarterback where you could fit Adams' contract and a Justin Jefferson contract. And if you're a KOC and you want to win now and you feel like this is our best opportunity to win, if you're the Vikings, you got to look at this division. You got to say, okay, Detroit's really our only scary benchmark that we have to overcome. And the Packers and the Bears, we don't like Packers and Bears, yeah, uh, Packers especially have been playing above the expectations, but how much longer can they play above the expectations? Right. And, do you value a first round pick like that much, or do you value like a certain guy on your roster that much? I mean, got Darisaw locked up, who franchise left tackle right there. Rest of the O line is not fucking horrible. Like it's it's serviceable enough to start. You and part of part of why they can do it is because last year, I mean, meaning this past draft, they did have two first round picks. Yeah, so exactly. They're able to do it. They they can go. We we've got talent already. Yeah, no, I can I can. That that's why I said the Vikings are a team to look out for too because. I could totally see it, and and if you're Devonte Adams, you're kind of like, pressure's not all me. I got Jettas. Yeah, I like yeah. Justin Jefferson. We're friends, and then not only that, like Kevin O'Connell is one of those guys. He gets everyone involved. He gets mm -hmm. everyone involved. Justin Jefferson also, despite being one of the best receivers, low ego, a low yes. ego wide receiver. One we saw that in the quarterback show when Kirk Cousins threw a horrible fucking ball. What did Jettas say after that? On me, dog. On me, dog. We saw that at LSU when Jamar Chase was going batshit insane. Justin Jefferson was just as good, but did not care. Was happy for his teammate. Justin Jefferson is one of those guys, like, a lot of people don't know his story. Three-star recruit. Justin Jefferson wasn't some five-star recruit coming out, uh, coming out. A guy that had to fight for a spot on the LSU roster. His spot was not guaranteed. He did not have a full scholarship. To Louisiana State University. It was like a partial scholarship. And it was based off if he made the football team, it would become a full scholarship. Yeah. And he got that full scholarship. He, he, this guy is just a humble fighter. 
And you got a guy like Devontae Adams, and I feel like that's missing on the Vikings sometimes is that eagle maniac wide receiver <laughs> that wants the ball. So like I'm not saying Jet like Jettas wants the ball, but he's not like he's not like Devontae Adams, where it's right, like right. where like we saw on the receiver show Adams was all like, nah, man, I don't care what the play is. I'm just throw the ball. I'm gonna catch it, Jimmy. Jimmy, you just gotta trust in me. <laughs> like, you know. So that's why I think the Vikings are a viable viable team. And I, I don't think that show made me feel so bad for Devontae Adams. And then I was like, nah, he's a Raider though. Fuck him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but I like, I'm just saying that like, those are teams that will most likely land Devontae Adams more than the Jets. Cause I don't think they like, cause look, Adams already got what he wanted. Green Bay did him a favor for doing well for them for so many years. They said, Hey, we don't want to pay you all this money. Cool. Just trade me to a team that will, I want to go play with Derek Carr. The Raiders said they would pay me. Okay. They gave you what you wanted. You're not going to get what you want a second time with the Jets. Yeah. And also, if you're the Jets long term, you just got this is what I'm saying. You just got to think long term. How much more years do you have with Aaron Rodgers? Like, do you really think that this makes sense? Well, see, that's, that's what I'm saying. That the window is close. I would I would be willing to spend the first round pick to try to make sure that I have as much opportunity in that window. Like basically, like what the Rams did. The Rams sold to get Stafford. They sold yeah. to get players, and they were like, we'll figure it out as long as we win a title. A title is forever. You yeah. try to win the title. Like, that's why, like, if I'm the Jets, I would be willing to give that first-round pick because uh, I go, yeah, it's pro- even if we don't – even if we, uh, you know, make the playoffs, we get to the, maybe the AFC title game and we lose. Like, let's say we lose to the Chiefs or potentially the Bills, whatever the case, however it shakes out. It's like pick number 29. Is it really like who are we going to get in the draft that is better than or we could develop to be better than a Devonte Adams? We might as well just spend it. I'm yeah. I would be willing to do it. I I I understand that. I just don't think Joe Douglas gets that. I don't think Joe. I don't that, I, like. I understand from a fan point. It's just Joe Douglas does value first round picks. He traded yeah. for three of them at one point. Like <laughs> people need to understand, your three. He's he's injured right now, but three. Three of those top players that are on your team, all first round picks. Like those are players, and, and yeah. Joe Douglas drafts players that are ready to play. Now he's not. You're, if you're a rookie, you gotta be ready to play for the Jets. You can't. You can't be one of these guys that oh, it's gonna take time to develop and stuff. Like the only reason why their Penn State tackle is not playing is because they already have two really good tackles and stuff like that. And he's just he's just an excellent swing tackle to have. And so yeah, no, I think the Jets. It's just. I don't know what they what I don't know what Joe Douglas is willing to give. Yeah, I mean to your, to your point, we can we don't even we can just look at the running back situation. They got Brees Hall. They also got uh is he uh Abataconda and Abataconda just did not look good and they said, Fuck it, we're getting Braylon Allen and Isaiah Davis and we're gonna figure this out. Is he you're you're pretty much gone out of here because you can't be RB two and we I can't trust you. And Michael Carter, you're also out of here because you don't look that mm-hmm. great anymore. We'd rather swing on these on these rookies and see if they can do the, in essence, bare minimum that we need you to do. And Braylon was like, "Yeah, no, I can do that. Absolutely, I yeah, can. yeah, exactly." So, but yeah, no, like, I think the Adams situation is going to be interesting. Uh, I believe the betting odds do have it where he is the favorite is the Jets, and then uh, second odds are the Chiefs, which oh, is funny. Jesus man. Why, why do they try to force the Chiefs to have a good one? I can't see the Raiders doing an in-division trade. Like, the Chiefs, the Chiefs would have to give them. I would be like, hey, he's already causing troubles for you guys. Give us Rashi Rice. <laughs> <laughs> he's more of a Raider, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, getting in a car accident, doing all this. Oh, that's a Raider if I ever seen one. But, yeah, no, I know we talked a lot about Adams, but I think it, it's a conversation that needs to be had talking about the Raiders, like if yeah. Adams will be traded. But, I do think Adams will get traded this year. Um, to who? I think it's more likely the Falcons than the Jets. I think the Falcons, because they overpaid for Judon and, and trade capital, because Judon's not worth a third round pick. Like, no, no. Like at his age, like maybe fifth round pick. You get that was one thing I, I give I give Poles credit for where he was like, Yeah, that's that's not I'm not paying I'm not paying that kind of a uh of a cost to get somebody who I'm not even gonna have under contract. It's not doesn't make sense. And that was for a fourth round pick. And then the Falcons give a third. But if there was one team that I don't think would win a Devontae Adams sweepstakes, but I really wish could win 
a Devontae Adams. <laughs> It's actually either of these two teams, now that I think about it. But the team I would love to see him with is the Bills from Buffalo. But I don't even think they need him. Because the way Josh Allen is playing, and granted, maybe it was just a shitty-ass Jaguars team. But that dude is just like, uh, you you maybe lose Stephon Diggs and Gabe Davis? That's fine. I'll find somebody else to throw to. Khalil Shakir's down there somewhere. Dalton Kincaid's over there somewhere. Shit, uh, we still have Dawson Knox for some reason. Uh, We we drafted Kincaid even though we had Knox. I'm going to throw it to him. Oh, what – We'll, we'll figure this out. Keon Coleman, I'm going to get him, start getting him involved. Yeah. It, it was, it, it's, it's, and, and low, and never, and don't forget, guys, I, I still got this running back over here. I don't know if you, I don't know if you heard of him. He shares the same, shares genetic material with Dalvin Cook. He was a pretty good pass catching back. We will be fine. And the Bills have looked absolutely fine if there was a team that was looking fine because they are clicking on all cylinders. And, you know, like I said, it could just be a situation where uh, they they were just beaten up on a terrible-ass uh, Jaguars team. And at the same time, it could be a situation where the Bills haven't really played tough teams. The first team, you know, Arizona Cardinals, They the Cardinals bounced back, but uh, the, the Cardinals seem to uh, snatch – defeat from the jaws of victory uh they also targeted marvin harrison four times in that game with only one catch for four yards and then they were like oh wait we did draft him and the next week we saw what happened uh but then they play the miami dolphins and halfway through the game uh Tua tries to kill himself uh by throwing himself headfirst into demar hamlin who you know maybe he was like this guy's already dead he's a ghost i'm just it, nothing's gonna happen uh, but gets the concussion and has to leave the game, and then they beat up on a Jacksonville Jaguars team. So maybe, maybe it's a situation where they haven't played tough competition. But all of that changes this Sunday night when they play the Baltimore Ravens. Oh man! Now we can say the Baltimore Ravens are not looking good. They are a one and two team. They lose. Uh, the opener against the Kansas City Chiefs Thursday Night Football. They lose to the Raiders in what was a ridiculous way to lose. That just did not make any sense. They let the Raiders hang around in there. And then they basically do the flip of what happens with the Raiders to the Cowboys, where they just were like, we're not playing around anymore. We mm-hmm. want to win this game. And now they're facing the Bills. It's a home game for the Ravens, but I, I don't feel comfortable with the Ravens because I don't know what they're trying to do on offense. Granted last week, they finally remembered, Hey, you know, we're really good at running the ball with Lamar. And then we also signed this guy, Derek Henry. Yeah. Uh, we are running back. Maybe we should use him similar to how the Cardinals were like, Oh shit, we drafted Marvin Harrison jr. Let's throw to him. Uh, and they finally started feeding Derek Henry the way that Derek Henry should get fed the ball. And it worked out, but the passing game, I don't know what's going on there because people were talking about Isaiah likely, you know, taking the next step and taking Mark Andrews's job. And the first week he did because Mark Andrews was bouncing back from a car crash that he had been in a few days prior. Yeah. Uh, and then the next week, both of them disappear. And then, th- and then last week, the tight end three, is leading in yards. <laughs> now, granted, it's all off of one catch, but Mark Andrews, I don't even think he re- – I think he didn't register a catch. I think he had some targets. And likely, I think had th- – I want to say three targets and two catches. I may be a little off there. But they barely use their tight ends, which is supposed to be one of the strengths of the team. They have Zay Flowers. They have Rashad Bateman, which Bateman's not that great of a receiver, great blocker, but not a great receiver. And Zay Flowers can only do so much. This would also be a great team for Devontae Adams to go to. Oh, oh yeah. I, besides <laughs> but, KC, those are two teams that are rated highly in the odds, too, to get him. I just don't think they would give up the capital for him. Right. But if there is a shining thing for the Ravens to sort of hang their hat on, it is the defense. And the Baltimore defense has given up a lot of points. They gave up 27 to KC. They gave 26 to the Raiders, and they gave up 25 to the Cowboys. So they're in this, you know, 
mid twenties range. And now they're going to be facing a team that has scored 34, 31, 47. Something's got to give. I don't mm-hmm. know if this Ravens defense can stop but the Buffalo offense. Now, to the Ravens defense credit. They're not playing guys that are have a high pedigree. Khalil Shakir, Dalton Kincaid, James Cook, uh, Dawson Knox. Yes, Cooks and uh, um, Shakir, Kincaid, Kincaid are good. Like they're they had high draft, uh, you know, either high draft or they've shown out. Khalil Shakir still is a fifth round pick, but is real is showing off really well. Keon Coleman. There's not been enough of him to really say that he is a dominant factor in this offense. Whereas when they played Kansas City, there was Rasheed Rice, there was Pacheco, even to his, you know, not doing much, but there was Travis Kelsey. You play the Raiders, there's Brock Bowers, there's Devontae Adams. You play the Cowboys, there's CeeDee Lamb, at least, who is at least worth two wide receivers. Yeah. So now you're facing an offense that, while, yes, they are feeling themselves, has not faced that great of a defense and doesn't really have bona fide stars on the team. However, they still got that guy, Josh Allen. Yep. And Josh Allen doesn't care. He's like, I'm going to throw this ball 40 times this game if that's what it takes. (laughs) I'm going to have James Cook run the ball 20 times if that's what it takes. Then I'm going to go home and I'm going to say hi to Haley. That's all that that's what's gonna happen. He, it, there's this level of confidence that he's playing with. Yeah. Like, it's now he now knows it's because of him, right? A lot of times the talk against the Bills was or particularly Josh Allen was this guy played terrible completion percentage wise until Stefan Diggs got there and then it jumped up. I wonder why. And so he was like, okay, cool. And now Stefan Diggs leaves, and people were like, well, maybe there should be a tail, maybe there'll be a, a little bit of a drop off. You know, there's no, like I'm saying, there's no bona fide stars. And Josh Allen says, I can make stars. This is a game that I feel is really well suited for Sunday Night Football. Prime time, the, you know, the, the, the cameras around from around the world are going to be watching. I think the Bills pull this one out. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, though, if it was the Ravens. But I, I respect this line being as close as it is yeah. because it is one of the more toss-up games. Like the previous game was a toss-up simply because it was like who's going to be shittier than the other. This is a toss-up because it's a high-powered offense powered by one guy against a decent to good defense. And the question is going to be can the Bills stop Derrick Henry? If yes. they can stop Derrick Henry – Ravens lose. Yeah, I think the Bills are just playing with house money. And Josh Allen, he, he he's on an MVP-type run right now. This is reminding me of Cam Newton's MVP season, where Cam oh, Newton – Cam Newton, Oh, yeah, yeah, we know how that ended. But I'm just saying, like, how he's playing with the talent that he has around him. Like, Cam Newton was throwing to Billy Brown and – freaking Ted Ginn on his last legs. Like it wasn't like, <laughs> like, like Cam wasn't throwing to like the, anything. And he played one of the best seasons of football you will see. I think it's the same thing with Josh Allen. I think he's playing really, really well. The Ravens defense, as much as we would like to say they did great, they almost lost that game to the Cowboys. They almost gave yeah. the Cowboys that win. And yes, the Buffalo defense has not faced a good offense, but that Miami offense was apparently good with Tua. And they shut down Tua for most of the game. So I I think the Bills are winning this game. I, I honestly, man, this this parlay of the Bills, Rams, and Saints, I think that's a good <laughs> underdog parlay, man. I think that's a fun one. I think that that's one that could actually hit. And if you oh, want to feel oh, you got no faith in my Broncos? No, it's plus 295. I, <laughs> I, 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 I would I would just bet them straight out. Like the Broncos, I wouldn't put in a part. That would be the one where I'm like, I got too greedy there. I, I chose the Broncos. Plus, like Broncos straight out, yeah, I'll throw fifty bucks on at plus two ninety five for sure. But I wouldn't put them in a hundred dollar parlay or a twenty five dollar parlay with with the teams that I'm choosing. Like normally with three teamers, I like to keep it where it's like 
three underdogs that I I know can win their games, not like three long shot like that. You're you're a lunatic if you do all that. But yeah, I think the bill. I think the Bills are just overall like just a better team than the Ravens too. The Ravens have shown me that they're just too shaky. And uh, but this is going to be a really really good game. Yeah, this is I like I said it's 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 on Sunday Night Football for a reason. Yeah. Uh, so oh, far, this man, game. <laughs> John, how do you think Al regrets leaving me, man? I mean, I'm having all these good games on Sunday night, and Al he's miserable on Thursday with Herbie, and uh, he should have just, just stayed on NBC, man. It, Amazon gave you all the bag, Al, but yeah, man, I'm having fun with Mike on Sunday night. I mean, I get to see Mahomes more than you do. I mean. <laughs> This is just great, John. I, I love this. <laughs> and that leads us to the two Monday night games. And uh, it's a shame uh, that one of these is going to be absolutely fucking terrible. Um, I do not understand how the Dolphins are technically favored Actually, no, they're not because the Titans. Oh no, it doesn't. It also no, it does make sense. The Titans are favored. Yeah. Against the Dolphins, my math was well, my brain was not working there for a sec. Uh, it does make sense because I don't. No, no, sorry, it doesn't make sense because how are the Dolphins supposed to be close when they're going to be trotting out Tim Boyle? Skylar Thompson took a shot to the ribs. I don't know if he's playing. I don't think he is, and if he's not. I mean, I'm not, which is, you know, this is a crazy sentence to say. If Skylar Thompson isn't playing, <laughs> like, I don't know how Miami is going to be able to mount much of an offense. If you are somebody who took in redraft Tyreek Hill very early, oh. he went either one or two. And you, and you're somebody else who got a chan in the back half of the first or maybe top of the second. Me. I really feel for you because yeah. this not going the way you thought it was gonna go the first week you were like okay well uh raheem mostert's not playing so h is gonna be getting this is this is great this is this is gonna be amazing and then the second week happened and you were like oh no but then well, thought, did great he, he still got 25 fantasy yeah. points and you then you thought all right well you know skylar thompson he almost beat the bills in the playoffs so he should be and, oh he took a his rib almost killed him. Oh, who's the backup to the back? Tim Boyle. And the, <laughs> you know, the funniest part is, because this guy played on both teams, uh, the Miami was like, yeah, we're not even looking at Ryan Tannehill. We're, like, we're not even, even going to kick the tires yeah. on Ryan Tannehill. At this point, I'd be like, I'll kick the tires on anybody <laughs> because I don't know what's going to happen with this team by the time Tua comes back. Because I know Tua is coming back because Tua said I'm coming back because I'm just a glutton for punishment. Apparently, I still say I don't care if you've got to pay money back as part of the, the, the contract that you just signed. There's $161 million guaranteed. Even if you got to give back half of it, that's still $80 million. That's still more money than like five people, five random people that you pick around the world will make in their lives combined. Mm-hmm. So like take the money and run. Like it's your brain. We, we, if you, if you need, if you need any kind of, uh, you know, information as to what you should do, watch, just rewatch. If you haven't already to, uh, watch that 30 for 30 special on the 85 bears. And when they get to the end and they talk about the CTE aspect and what's going on with Jim McMahon, uh, yeah, that could be you yeah. and it probably will be you already. I don't know if like I respect competitors, like I respect the fact that you want to compete, but shit, dude, I don't know. But that is the quarterback on injured reserve. I don't even I don't think we know who's going to be the quarterback for the Dolphins on Monday. Luckily, it's on Monday, so they have an extra day to try to figure it out. But the Titans, meanwhile, are so hit and miss that we don't like I I it's another team where I don't know what to how to feel about the Titans because like they have these weird flashes where Levis plays like great for a drive. And then the next drive, he throws a pick or he fumbles the ball or something just goes wrong. And it's like, yeah, you have Deandre Hopkins. Yeah. You have Calvin Ridley. You've got Tony Pollard. You've got Tyje Spears. Uh, Chiggs is there, but like, 
I don't know who they are. I don't know what their identity is supposed to be. Are they trying to be a, a, a high-powered throwing offense? Because you're running a lot with Pollard and with Ty J Spears. Are you trying to be just uh, more of a ball control offense? Well, you're throwing a lot with Calvin Ridley and DeAndre Hopkins. So I don't – I honestly, I'm picking the Titans solely because – I don't know who the hell is going to be the quarterback for Miami at this point. Yeah, McDaniel said that Skylar Thompson's day to day. They did sign Snoop Huntley, former Pro Bowl quarterback, oh, uh, right. from from the practice squad of the Ravens last Monday. Maybe this gives him time to learn the playbook. He's a little bit better than uh, Tim Boyle, but uh, I, he said that if Skylar Thompson's healthy, he is the guy for the Dolphins. But the Dolphins, for being known as the fastest team in the NFL, high-scoring offense, have only scored 33 points this season, the worst in the NFL. They are the worst offense in the NFL. And if you name the names, it's – It would be the Broncos. Sorry. Let me get that out of my If you you name the names on this team, it's kind of ridiculous. And I'll know that – I know this. The Titans, Will Levis. (laughs) It's, It's such a horrible chaos to watch. You either win, he either wins you the game or loses you the game. He can still throw touchdowns when needed. That's yeah. the thing Will Levis can do, and that's why the Titans will win this football game is because they can actually score touchdowns. And the Dolphins, they need one of those big. They need an a chan eighty yard touchdown run or seventy yard, sixty yard touchdown run, yeah. or most or to piece healthy that kind of run for them to you know score. Like they can't score. Like, they can't even move the ball. Like, the offense was so putrid. And Skylar Thompson can't even throw 50-plus yards because they did, They literally did a Hail Mary, and he didn't even chuck it. He didn't even try to yeah. chuck it. He literally was just, like, looking down the field. And it was just like, bro, like, at least try. Like, what, what's the worst case that happens? You just get a long punt out of this. Like, nothing bad's going to happen. There's a lot of people there to stop if you get intercepted. But, yeah, I – I just think the the uh, Titans are an overall better team than the Dolphins right now, and they should win this football game. You know what's crazy is that the so <laughs> this is a t- this is it, it, the crazy thing about this is it can go both ways. The Titans offense has scored 17, 17, 14. Mm-hmm. The Miami defense allowed seventeen the first week when they had Tua. And then they allowed 31 against the Bills and 24 against the Seahawks. On the flip side, the the the, the Titans' defense has allowed 24, 24, and 30. And the Miami offense, 20 with Tua, 10, and 3. So, like, the Titans' defense is terrible enough to the point that they could allow some points. And the Miami offense is terrible enough to the point that – uh, the, sorry, the Miami defense is terrible enough to the point without Tua being there to balance it out that they could allow the Titans to score some points. So in a, I don't know what the the we I'll have to look and see what by um, by Monday what the over under is. I'd be actually willing to take the over because mm-hmm. <laughs> it's 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 two terrible offenses and two terrible defenses like yeah. Miami's, and that's the thing Miami's defense on paper really good but yeah. they the way that offense is set up is they're designed to defend from ahead and they're designed to know that similar to the Kansas City offense a defense we can sell out to do different things because we know Tua and the speed of the offense can make up for things that go wrong if we need to sell out to try to stop the, the opposing offense. So, man, this one's going to be – this. it's going to be ugly. You said you took the Titans, right? Oh, yeah, taking the Titans easily. And that leads us to the final game of week four, the second Monday night game, Lions and the Seahawks. And this is a re- – like on paper, this is a fun yeah. NFC showdown. This is, I mean, I would not be surprised if, like, they do, like, uh, you know, the, um, like, we talk about AEW ratings and things like that, and people switch yeah. their channels, especially Monday night, and then you go back to, like, the Monday Night Wars and wrestling. The amount of people that will be watching Dolphins and Titans simply because it's, like, an hour before, <laughs> the amount of people that will switch, <laughs> switch over back. 
<laughs> and not switch back is going to be, I think it should be pretty high. Unless there's some ridiculous, like, uh, Skylar Thompson is just like, fuck it, somebody's down there, and I'm just going to throw it. And, and Will Levis is like, fuck it, Hop Hopkins and Ridley are down there somewhere. I'm just going to throw it. Unless we get something crazy like that, I can't anticipate that game being that interesting or exciting. But Lion Seahawks, oh, man. You've got DK Metcalf, JSN ascending, basically taking that uh, YR2 job from uh, Tyler Lockett, saying, old man, we respect what you've done for Seattle, but you're now the wide receiver three on this team. No offense, looking like, I can make some catches. And Zach Charbonnet going, you know, if teams had drafted me in order to be their starting running back, I could have done some things. But... I was not drafted to be a starting running back. I was drafted to be K-9's backup. And hey, Walker's out. I'm going to make the most of this. And yeah. he's being absolutely phenomenal. He is showing why some teams maybe should have drafted him to be their starting running back or maybe like, their backup. I, love, I really Char like Charbonnet out of college. He was really good. And then on the flip side, you've got the Lions. And the Lions, yes, allowed – the Cardinals to feel competitive against them, right? Like they allowed it to cut, like it was closer than 20 to 10. It felt closer because they couldn't move. They scored, but then they couldn't move the ball for large stretches of the, of the game. However, this is still a Lions offense that has Amon Ross St. Brown, Jamison Williams, Sam Laporta, Jameer Gibbs, David Montgomery. And yes, Laporta got banged up, but one, he did return to the game. So that was that was reassuring. And two, it's a low ankle sprain. So the yeah. odds of him playing are higher. But it's also a situation where we saw uh, his backup, Brock Wright, play pretty damn well, where they could say, Laporta, take a week because we need you for the stretch run down the road yeah. for the playoffs. We can we can we can muddle through a Seahawks game because did you Sam listen to the the list of names that John just said? We've got Amon Ross St. Brown, yeah, got Jamison Williams, we've got Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery. This should be really good, and it's two uh, good defenses. The Lions' defense isn't the greatest compared, especially compared to the Seattle defense, but it's still good enough where they could cause some problems. Oh, yeah. For a player like a Geno Smith, uh, quarterbacking the Seahawks, and the Seahawks defense is actually really good. So yeah, played well. How this one shakes out, it's going to be fun. I I like the fact that the Lions are favored at home. Seattle's got to travel over there. This one, I think, it's going to be really fun to watch. Picking it though is tough. And and I like it when it, I like having tough choices to make in this because it means the games should be good. I'm gonna go with the Lions because of home field advantage. I'm gonna go with the Lions simply because I trust them more. Mm -hmm. to run the clock out. Yes, when they need to. And 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 MCDC is still you know going for those fourth and ones, fourth and twos, whatever. But he's also he has shown a willingness now to take the points when he needs to take the points. So I'm giving it to the Lions. Uh, I'm. I think also this. I, I'm wondering. I need. I'm wondering how this line is looking right now. If they're anticipating because we're doing this on a Tuesday night. If they're anticipating Kenneth Walker playing. Yeah, if Kenneth Walker's playing. I think it does change that this this uh, this game a bit. I would still probably give it to the Lions, but I would not be surprised if we're looking at like a thirty to twenty seven or something like that. Like you know, something where it's like a field goal determined the game. Yeah, the Lions have played a lot of close games this year, and uh, they either lost or won those close games. So you know that. They're, they're built for this type of game. And and really, to be honest, this is more of a prove-it game for the Seahawks than it really is for the Lions because the Seahawks, yeah. they have a, a prime opportunity to really, like, say, hey, like, based on the Niners have started, the Rams' uh, record, and if the Cardinals drop the game Sunday, this could be your chance to win the NFC West. Like, you could really win the NFC. Seattle winning the NFC West is not anything too crazy. And, in fact, if you're someone looking at that bet, 
I would place it before this game because if they win this game, they will be the automatic favorites to win the NFC West, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I think the Seahawks, a lot of their games, I just like, especially late, I haven't been impressed with them. Like the Lions, they've won those close games. They've lost close games, but they've also won them and they've always been in the games and they have had chances to win, especially against Tampa Bay. They should have absolutely won that game. They just shot themselves in the foot. Mm. Seahawks, I feel like their defense lets up in those later portions of the games and let teams hang around too often. And yeah. that, and also like some of the games that they played against, I'm like, okay, well, like, who are you facing? Like, you know, like the, the teams that they're facing, not world beaters, like Broncos, they, they kind of let their foot off the gas after, at, at the end of the yeah, game. I mean, I'll, I'll just come out. I'll come out and say it. That game should have been like 26 to 17, 26 to 14. Not twenty six to twenty. Yeah, and then the Patriots they they almost fumbled that game, and <laughs> that that was a good. And then they took they took advantage of Skylar Thompson. So this is a big test for the Seahawks against a really good Detroit team. And this is a must win, like not a must win, but this is a huge proof. This is more of like for Seattle. Can you prove that you're more than just like a playoff team that makes the wild card, yeah. or are you a team that? truly can ascend and be a divisional threat could be an NFC championship threat. But ultimately I think the lions do win this game. I think the lions on paper, better team have played in these close games and uh, know how to finish the job. If Jared Goff doesn't turn the football over, like when Goff doesn't turn the football over, it's a really good team. But when Goff starts getting goofy and he starts throwing turnovers, it's hard for the lions to win. Uh, the lions did lose Davenport who was playing really well for them. For the season so that mm -hmm. kind of hurts their pass rush a little bit but i still think even with the loss of davenport they're still the better team than the seahawks but i wouldn't be surprised if seattle does win this game because the seahawks every time you want every, every time you want to count them out they somehow find a way to win but this is a big big game for them absolutely because yeah. if they win I, this game four and oh yeah if if over and wow so what you're to to I think both of us anticipate the Niners writing the ship, the it, people getting healthy, and coming back and winning the division. So let's assume for a moment that Seattle is a wild card spot. We don't really know because of how the Vikings are playing how the NFC North is going to shake out. Let's assume yeah. for a moment that you know uh, that the um, that uh, the Lions. Even if they win the division, they, they could be playing in the first round. But let's assume also, for argument's sake, that they're a wild card team as well. This could be a this could be a wild card weekend matchup yep. easily, easily. So this is a this is a a you know we're starting off a uh, week with Giants Cowboys. <laughs> they gotta they gotta the Cowboys got to win the game. Uh, yeah. but we're ending the week super strong with the very last game with Lions and Seahawks. That Sunday night football game, that's going to be uh, – that's also a potential wild card uh, matchup because if Mike Tomlin can keep the Steelers rolling, and hell, if they trade for Devontae Adams, uh, they, yeah. they, could be, they, could be, they could be very frisky. There, this is – we've got some interesting uh, playoff – Previews, potential yeah. previews. You could you could make an argument that Falcon Seahawk, uh, Falcon Saints is a uh, is a is a preview. You could make an argument that where where was the other one I was thinking of? Uh, Buccaneers Eagles could be a a, a wild card um, or a playoff preview. Shit, you could even argue maybe even com Cardinals Commanders. Yeah, because of how Jaden Daniels playing. There's there's a lot, particularly the NFC actually. There's a lot yeah. of <laughs> NFC uh, playoff preview games that we could be watching week four. And you and I were talking about this last week about how certain teams needed to win because it would be conference uh, tiebreaker in, uh, dependent for the playoffs. There are some really important games this week for the NFC conference when it comes to determining playoff getting into the playoffs and playoff seating when it for uh for for wild card purposes so we will be really looking forward to 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 a lot of these games but here you have it our uh chasing my pickums for week four 
Remember, we are doing this on a Tuesday because uh, we want to make sure we get it out to you guys on a Wednesday or early Thursday. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to these games. These lines will more than likely change. We've got players that we don't know uh, will be playing or will not be playing, um, but we will be watching on the watch alongs. And we hope that all of you guys will join us here on the True Hill Heat Sports and Entertainment channel. But also, we hope that you guys will join Chase on the Around the Point channel. And Chase, tell the people what you guys are up to on Around the Point and where they can find you guys. Yeah, you guys can catch me on the Around the Point network. Uh, we will be obviously reviewing AEW this Thursday. So that should be a fun that should be a fun review, as always, talking about all elite wrestling. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Nothing else really going on on that channel. Next week will be the more busier week for wrestling. So and guys, you can always catch me here on the True Hill Heat Sports and Entertainment. Uh, every once in a while, nowadays, I'll pop in on the on the wrestling side of things. But uh, we want to thank you all for tuning in. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe if you have not already. Until next time, remember to take care of yourselves and each other. And Chase and I will catch you guys later.